Hello everybody, good evening and welcome to your very own Baiju's 9th and 10th grade channel. I'm your teacher Aishwarya. And hi everyone, I'm your teacher Ankita and we welcome you all in today's SST paper. Yes. No, paper discussion, it's a practice paper. It's a first practice paper discussion that we have. Last class when we had a discussion about the sample paper and today we are discussing the practice paper one. So I hope that all of you are ready. It's a very interesting paper ma'am, right? Yes. And very importantly students, you should have an understanding between the difference between what's a sample paper and a practice paper, right? Sample paper is what is officially released, which is very similar in terms of pattern for your board exams. You have your practice paper that is there, it's additional questions, right yes. ma'am, for practice for them. Yeah. But also it comes with slightly higher competency, right? Yeah, you don't have to get afraid of the questions, ma'am, it's very difficult and such type of questions will come, can come and cannot come. So. We, when we are solving the practice paper, should have a mindset that we are just doing the practice if we are thorough with the content that we have in our NCRT textbook, then we don't have to worry about anything. Okay, and I can see many of you like uh, uh, Ayushman and many others have SST exam coming tomorrow, which means that today we will not only be efficient in solving your paper, but we will also make it a point that we do a good revision, right? And I think team 7 is saying good morning, but you mean good evening. So good evening to all of you. Yes. So very quickly students, as we do a normal check, hope that our audio, our video and our screens and whatever we are writing is all good and a-okay. If it is, give us a quick thumbs up, right? And let us know that we are good to go. And very quickly, we will get started. Awesome. Oh ma'am, good evening. Ma'am, many of them are here. Many new students, yes. many regular students. I hope that all of you are ready for the session and I hope that all of you are well prepared, right? Have your textbook if you want to have your all the textbooks, right? Have a notebook, have your pen, right? So that you can, you know, keep on noting down the important points that we'll be discussing in the class. Yes. Apart from that, please have your water bottle because we definitely have. And we'll be keep on sipping water and you should also. Yes. So how long is this class going to be? That is also something we would like to address. Now see the competency in these questions are slightly difficult. But we'll try to be as quick as possible. So ma'am probably we will do it maximum in one and a half hours. We'll try to wind it up by nine o'clock. Let's hope. Yes. <laughs> so we are going to give ourselves the time as well. That we will keep on our 30 minutes or maybe two hours at the maximum. And we'll try to wind up the class at least by 9 p.m. Considering we are starting the stream at 7.30 maybe by 9.30 at the latest, right ma'am? Hopefully ma'am. Yes. I'll, I, we will say hopefully because yeah, let's be hopeful. Yes, <laughs> we have to be hopeful. <laughs> I know there is a glitch in the video that's coming because of the stream that is there. So when I, I think normally you will find the glitch. Don't ignore our video. Listen to us, see the screen more than enough. How yeah. we look is secondary. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. So everybody, I think I'll hand it over to Ankita Ma'am where she'll take you through the general instructions okay. and we'll get started. Yes, everyone. So here, general instructions, very easy, I'm sure. We have a similar instructions in a sample paper also. We'll just quickly go through them. We have a time of three hours, right? The paper that you will be writing in your board examination will be of three hours. Total marks are 80. 80 marks will be there, right? We have six different sections from A, B, C, D and F. A section has MCQs. 20 questions are there in the MCQs, right? We have section B main, we have two marks questions, right? And we have 21, 22, 23, 24, four questions over here. Then we have section C, which is of three marks. It has also questions. Then section D has five marks and section E is very special because it has a case-based study questions, right? Last but not the least, we have the map work in the section F for five marks. So I hope that all of you are clear with this. Good evening, everyone. So good to see that all of you are here. Come on, don't be, you know, in a mood that we will be able to finish it off, everyone. Don't be scared of SST. It's a very, very interesting subject, right? Okay, everyone, please make sure you hit the like button. Okay. Before we start the session, everyone, we have, we have made a small, very short to test for all of you. So please make sure you go and give the answer of those particular questions, right? We have the link in the description box below right now, if you will be able to see, right? You can go, no, not now, probably after the class and then answer those questions, right? There's a very interesting thing that you will be getting. Basically, you will be getting, your name will be featuring on the community post. And of course, it's a good thing and you will be able to, you know, actually solve those questions and you will have more confidence. So please make sure everyone, you solve those questions and we are starting without taking much of your time. Let's get started. So now my speed will reduce. 
right and we'll just focus on the question paper so starting with the section a everyone and the first question is from the history how was the Rollitz Act of 1990 perceived in terms of fundamental rights and civil liberties by Indians? Easy peasy everyone. Let's read the option carefully. See everyone, these are direct line from the NCRT. If you have been reading NCRT regularly, you will be able to find the answer. I am telling you the questions are very easy. This time, right, both the CBSC have done in the question paper in the sample paper in the practice paper also is that that they have given the questions by picking up the lines from NCRT directly. Very good. How was the Rollitz Act of 1919 perceived in terms of the fundamental rights and civil, uh, civil liberties by Indians? A. It has views as a regressive legislation in the favor of the majority Indians. B. It was considered as a severe cruelty in the rights of the personal liberty. Option C, it was seen as a necessary uh, measure to prevent the communal tension or it was regarded as a safeguard to, for protecting British soldiers. Very good everyone, I can see the correct answer. I hope that all of you are, have voted for your answer in the polls also. Very good everyone. The correct answer, the correct answer over here is option number B. It was considered as very crucial, right? Very severe steps um, in terms of the right of the person yes awesome this is not a which said but this is a practice paper we have the sample paper right we have the sample paper then we have the practice paper so this is the practice paper one okay now i'll be calling ashwarya ma'am for the next question we'll be switching in between everyone because we will be solving the question in the order yeah so please don't mind our switches right <clears throat> now the question here is Ankur, a resident from Rajasthan, decided to install a submersible water pump in his house, which is, which is capable of extracting groundwater from depths of 250 to 300 meters. Now, what happened after Ankur did this? Many people decided that, hey, this is becoming us, you know, this is very good, this is helpful for us. So, let's also start doing it. Now, they're going to, uh, what the inference here is, if they do this, right, if they do this, what is the, if this growing practice increases, what is most likely to lead in the near future? So if people start to keep installing pumps that is extracting groundwater, what is going to be the impact of it, right? So here, this is from water resources chapter and let's go through the options very quickly. Decline in groundwater quality, reduced monsoon water resources, increased number of water diseases, or is it water scarcity resulting from excessive utilization? Very, very simple. If people are using too much of groundwater, is it going to affect the quality or is it going to affect the quantity? It is going to affect quality, right? So if it affect, I mean, it is going to affect quantity. So in this case, what do you need to know? Here, quantity is getting affected. So no, not the decline in quality of water. Reduced monsoon water resources here, there has been no inference to monsoon, right? Neither are, is there going to be increase in waterborne diseases because again, that is with respect to quality of water. So in this case, what would be the answer? The answer here is going to be option D, that is water scarcity resulting from excessive utilization. Correct answer here is D, you will get one mark for identifying this. So read the case carefully and infer, yes? Now let's move on to the next question, which is from the chapter Minerals and Energy Resources, which I know I've not directly done it, but we will do it soon, so don't worry. And previous videos are available on the channel anyway. So we have a map which gives us the distribution of thermal and nuclear power plants across India, okay? Now they're saying that there is air quality index, AQI, that gives us the level of water air pollution levels. Now, we see that there are some regions which are marked as P, some regions marked as Q, some regions marked as R and S, right? So, here in this particular case, which of these regions, right, is most likely to experience a comparatively better AQI, yes? Options are A which says P, Q, R, S. Revision of map, I will be doing it soon, but if you have your pre-boards coming up, there is a video where I have done this, right? It says complete maps for um, boards, map revision, I think. it's. I did it for just before the board exams, which will tell you about all the important topics. Joy, you can watch that. 
See, they are telling that this is okay. Think of it logically. Now we're going to solve it as somebody who is not. See, now I, I can also tell you technically where I tell you what thermal plant is found where and which is the nuclear power plant. But let's be logical about, ma'am, if I don't remember where I will find my power plant or nuclear plant, how do I know? Now they've told you that these are all what is represented, everything that is given as dot 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 represents thermal and nuclear power plants. Now if we find thermal and nuclear power plants, we know that more the number, more the pollution, right? So more number of thermal plants means the air quality in index will decrease, yes? So in this case, what do you observe? We see that here in the case of P and Q in near areas, we find more number of them concentrated, right? While on the other hand, even though in S, we find that it is slightly scattered. In region R, we see that it is very, very less, right? Very, very less. So in this case, what do we see, right? In this case, we see that air quality will be better when the air pollution levels are less. That means we find lesser number of such thermal and nuclear power plants. So if there are more number of power plants, more air pollution. Lesser number, less pollution. So Bhavleen and many of you, in the case of P, Q and S, we see that more number of plants are found concentrated in the area marked. While here, less number of it, which means lesser air pollution, hence better air quality. So correct answer is going to be option C. Correct answer here is option C, which means that R is the place where AQI will be better. Yes? Are we clear? Use your logic in such questions. Okay? Use your logic. Figure out. Okay, ma'am, I need to do this and that. Cool. <coughs> Okay. Are we good? Cool. Let's go on to the next question. Next question is a little bit of generic question. It's very generic. Reena, a 28-year-old woman from a marginalized community, is uneducated but adept at making traditional handicraft. Her family toils hard to afford two square meals every day. According to which objective would be most crucial for improving Reena and her kin's well-being? Now, I feel like this overlaps a little bit with uh, Ankita ma'am's topics also, right? So, Ankita ma'am, you don't mind me taking this question? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, social may here, there, everything will overlap and come, so don't mind. Now, what is it? Increasing access to clean energy. See, what is Reena good at? Use logic again. She is good at doing traditional handicraft. Now, giving uh, Reena more clean energy is not going to solve a problem because here we need to tackle employment, right? Reducing impact of climate change on Reena's community, well, not really, right? It's not going to help her make money. Ensuring that Reena has same rights and opportunity as men in her community, well, yes. But what is most crucial for improving her family and her kin? Her kin means family, right? What will help in improving her well-being? in making sure that we give more training opportunities for Rina and such artisans, right? So this right here, as you all know, is going to help you create more training opportunities. Thereby, we see that this right here helps in improving Rina's potential for making sure that there are more opportunities where she's able to earn more money, right? So correct answer is option C. Very happy to hear that, Divyanshu, your exam went well, so happy. I'm so Good. Let us know how much you do well also. I am seeing A.V. in class after a very long time. Hello, A.V. Uh, Ashwini, I will be taking the remaining chapters by next week is my aim. Right? Okay. Kin means family. Now, next up, we have... Okay, let's have a look at this. India's green energy goals have a serious problem. The Great Indian Bustard of... What? Uh, the Great Indian Buster. A Wildlife Institute of India conducted a survey covering 80 kilometers of power lines across Thar Desert and found out that four busters were critically endangered species and there were four deaths that occurred during a single year due to transmission wires that included some which were connected to wind turbines. Now, should installation of such power lines be reconsidered in areas where such species are found? Yes or no? Yes, alternative, power, uh, alternative methods of power generation should be explored to minimize the risk. Yes, the goals of protecting biodiversity is the only goal which should be prioritized. No, power lines outweigh the, the benefit of power, li power lines, outweigh the negative impact. This and all, no. 
we need to save energy we need to save our biodiversity so forget these two options now you are left with between a and b what will be the answer now here four busters were killed because of high transmission wires which means that normally in such cases we need to explore alternative methods that will minimize the risk right so in this particular case what do we see answer is option a prioritizing biodiversity is not our only goal right if we make that as our only goal many other things will get affected we also need to see what is beneficial as well for the overall well-being of everyone which is why in this case the correct answer is going to be option a yes so with this we have covered about five questions and now we will move on to question number six which is assertion reason and on power sharing so i will call ankita ma'am here to take up the next question how to study social lot of active recall needs to be done with you on so that you are able to do but every subject whether it be physics chemistry biology i mean is it going to be history geography political science or economics all of them have different strategies so we will keep telling you how to go about it yes okay so ma'am handing it over to you pool is there we can just yes everyone so here we i'm sure you all have read the question we'll be moving like this yes we have the question from the chapter power sharing we have a session on the reason power sharing can help to prevent conflicts in society right the reason for that is power sharing ensure that the different social groups are included in decision making process reducing marginalization and fostering inclusiveness so it's a very easy question right we have to find out whether both the statements are correct or not or whether the reason is a correct explanation for a we all know that assertion reason the assertion statement is absolutely correct we know that power sharing can actually help to prevent the conflicts in the society why by it make sure that the social groups are sharing the responsibilities they are a part of decision making process right it will be reducing the differentiation so the correct option over here will be option number c and i can see that majority of you have voted for the correct answer very good everyone option number c is the correct answer super super interesting and super proud of all of you i hope that this is clear to each one of us right easy question okay why not d bachche because the reason is a correct explanation the question is asking why the power sharing power sharing actually help to reduce the conflict between the between the society why how it does that because power sharing assure that the people are sitting and discussing they have their opinion they are participating in making a decision together and hence we can clearly say that the reason is the correct explanation i hope that you got it radhika hello av yes welcome back to the class and i'm good thank you bachche yes everyone chaliye moving to the question uh, next question question number 7 here we have in an indian state community x and y have been engaged in a long standing conflict over issues of coexistence and resource sharing the tension has intensified leading to the demand for both the community for a self administration what is the best resolution of this particular conflict yes purnima poonam it could be bacche ke you are attending the class after a long time please make sure you go recap the sessions and come back very good everyone bahut hi easy question hai right in this question the the scenario is that we have a indian state right which has two communities and both of these communities are fighting amongst each other for the resources for their existence so and both of these community want a self government do you think that that's a right thing and amongst the option we have to find the best way that actually we can help these people very good is it by collapsing the present government due to its inefficiency in the governing state no delaying the demands of the self administration and maintaining the current power structure definitely not we know that that's not feasible in a uh, when the uh, the humans are involved imposing strict restrictions to control the movement and interaction of both the communities that is also not correct the correct over here is to establish a power sharing both the communities coming together sharing the power right where they both the parties can be play a very important role in the decision making and hence both the communities will feel that they are equally important their their words are been heard and that's how they can live 
with the harmony. Okay? So here everyone. Surprisingly, we have two questions of MCQs from the same chapter. Power sharing, power sharing. Chaliye. Moving to the question number 8 everyone. Which of the following is a definite indicator? Read the question carefully everyone. Which of the following is a definite indicator of the successful implementation of the democratic governance? Easy? Very good, very good. Which of the following is a definite indicator of a successful implementation of the democratic governance? Is it a free economy dictated by the market's force, provision of basic amenities to the citizens, establishment of the central financial institution or establishment of the institute to protect people's rights? Very good everyone, I am super proud of you. Each one of you have studied thoroughly and you are exam ready. Very good everyone, the correct answer over here is option number D. We are talking about a definite indicator that actually shows that we have a good democratic government, uh, government and how we can identify that if we have the institution which are being made so that they can protect the people's right. Okay? Yes. Uh, Varshini, you are asking ma'am, why not B? We are not talking just about the basic amenities, right? The basic amenities so are there. But what about the fundamental rights, right? So basic amenities, people's right may we have the basic right. Right of speech, right to live in a hygienic condition, right? All of these are kind of mandate. We have six important fundamental rights. Along with that, these are the basic rights that we have. Clear? So if you look from the democratic government point of view, say, establishment of the institution to protect the people's rights. That is the right answer over here. I hope that those of you had a confusion. I hope that it's clear now. Yes? Everyone, I hope that you're clear with this question. Why not B is the correct answer? Right? Provision of a basic amenities. Basic amenities, what we'll have? We'll have the washrooms. We'll have the clean water. All of these are the basic uh, necessities of the individual. Yes? Okay. Chali. Moving to the next question, everyone. Here we have the next question and we'll be calling Ashwarya ma'am now. It's from the economics. Okay. So let's have a look and again this is assertion reason questions. So now of course we have question number 9 where there are two statements given to us. Yes, okay. Oh my god, 79 and Wow, Sujit, Saujit, very good, very, very good, proud of you. Now let's have a look at this assertion reason. Self-help groups are instrumental in promoting economic democracy. Reason is they contribute to more equitable distribution of economic power and opportunities. So in this case, what would be the answer? Now I always tell you that for assertion and reason, what is our technique? Technique number one is to look at them as individual statements and identify if they are true or false. Self-help groups are instrumental in promoting economic democracy. Yes, they are. And remember, I always tell you, no, self-help groups include mainly women, right? And it, it, especially foreign areas wherein, let's say, proper form sources of, uh, if they're not able to have proper formal sources, self-help group becomes very important, right? Wherein they are able to facilitate lending processes, they are able to, you know, sort of empower those people. So in such cases, we know that yes, it promotes economic democracy amongst, let's say, people in such cases. So true. Now what are they saying? They contribute to more equitable distribution. Which means that in self-help groups, I always tell you, you know, imagine group of aunties in your neighborhood, if they come together, decide to take over, you know, matters of business and money in the neighborhood, your self-help group is something of that sort, right? So in this case, this is also true. Now, your A, your step number one is clear. Step number two, if the, is, is it really the correct explanation? Ask yourself why. How does it promote economic democracy? Because we see that it contributes towards more equitable distribution where women are also involved and that also promotes what you say their independent it also puts women in a position where they are able to contribute to such things, right? So more equitable distribution in terms of power and opportunities, which is why in this case, what do we see? Our correct answer is option C, where it explains it's a correct explanation. I can see many of you are giving me your scores and you're saying that you've scored 79 and a half, 80. I would not want to call you comedy show, so please tell me your name. But very proud of you for getting good marks, right? Awesome. Now I will call on to Ankita. I will call Ankita ma'am because we are back to power sharing. So ma'am, over to you. 
Yes, everyone. Here we have the next question. It's a very long. It's it's a long question, everyone. <laughs> okay. So let's quickly read. Very good. Very good. Congratulations for your marks in your examination. The principle of the subsidiary emphasis. Now, what does this word mean? If you don't understand the meaning of this particular word, we'll not be able to actually find the answer. The principle, the word subsidiary actually means that uh, you know you have some authority and they can do their function, right? The principle of the uh, okay, the principle of the subsidiary emphasis that the decision should be made by the people who are most affected by them, promoting decentralization, efficiency. Citizen participation in the government and with a higher level of authority intervening only when the lower level authorities are unable to address certain issues. Which of the following constitutional principle or the legislation is very close to the alignment with the principle which is stated above? Very easy question, right? Though the question looks really very big, but if you read it and if you understand it, you will be able to find the answer. It's such an easy question. Very good, everyone. So what is the correct answer over here? It's not... The option number A. Why? Because separation of power between the executive, legislation and judiciary. We are not talking about that over here as of now. We all remember in the federalism, right? We have the state government. We have, sorry, we have the central government. We have the state government and we, then we have the local government. We all understand that uh, the central government will not be able to control the work or will not be able to look de in detail at the village level, right? And hence they have mentioned decentralization. Everyone, the question is giving us a hint over here. Decentralization. Now decentralization, we all remember that. What was there in the decentralization? It was to not hold the power altogether, but to give it to the lower level also. Yes? Yes, everyone. Very good, Radhika. Very good. Yes, Rishu. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. So what we have over here? Option B will be the correct answer. Right, everyone? Option number B will be the correct answer. Yes, vertical di division of the power. Okay? It will not be the right of the individual to form and join political parties. No, that's not that we, what we are discussing over here. And reservation of women are the highest. No, that's not the case over here, right? They're definitely, it's a very valid point, but not in the context of this particular question. Yes, very good. So, everyone, over here, the option number B is the correct answer. Now again, we'll call Ashwara ma'am because we have a question on the globalization. Okay. Awesome. <coughs> this is a very interesting question. And students, next week I'll complete globalization chapter. So not to worry, but globalization is a very easy chapter. So globalization is increasing inter is 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 the increasing interconnectedness of the world through the flow of goods, services, capitals, ideas and people. Okay. Which of the following is an example of example that represents globalization. One is an online advertising portal for goods sold by local vendors run by the Indian government. Okay. An IKEA store selling products manufactured in China. Fine. A traditional, traditional Vietnamese market selling crepes in Hanoi. Selling handicrafts. I don't know what's happened to me today. Selling handicrafts in Hanoi or a Sunday market selling groceries produced locally. See, globalization, they've even given you the definition so that you don't need to remember what it is also. Now, see, they're saying globalization is the increasing interconnectedness of the world, right? That means it is as good as me saying if today I start my own, let's say, shop, right? And I start my own bakery, which says I shoe bakery. And I decide that I will open up a branch in Bangalore. And then I want to go international. So next up, my next stop is New York, right? So I'm going to sell traditional Indian desserts in I shoe bakeries. And I'm going to sell it in New York. So there, what happens? We're bringing in culture, right? We're bringing in culture. We're bringing in, say, products from a different country, sending it in another country, right? Which brings in flow of goods, services, ideas, and people. So in this particular case, what do you see? We see that the correct answer is option B. Because if you look at traditional Vietnamese market selling handicraft in Hanoi, there is no interconnectedness of different cultures and people, right? It's happening within the same country. Or similarly, Sunday market selling it locally. No. Hanoi is a place in Vietnam itself. That's why no. Now what about this? Groceries in a local area? Absolutely not. 
local online advertising portal sold by local vendors in Indian government. So again, it is happening within the country itself, right? It's an Indian brand lo locally, you know, selling its stuff. Absolutely not. But an IKEA store, which is not based off India, we see that it is selling in Bangalore. It's opened up an outlet in Bangalore, selling products which are manufactured from China. So what is happening? There is flow of goods, flow of capital, ideas and people across different worlds. So are you clear with this? See, always look for two different countries coming together in globalization. There should be a flow of money, flow of goods or maybe ideas. Only then it is going to be simple. I mean, then you know that that would be the answer. Good? Okay. Now we have a question based on civil disobedience movement. So I'm going to call Ankita ma'am for the same. Yes, everyone. So let's take a look at the question number 12. And the question is... The Indian masses willingly participated in the civil disobedient movement. Despite the challenges faced during the non-cooperation movement, according which of the following quotes best reflects the outlook of the masses? It's an interesting question, direct line from NCRT. And I can see it's the easiest, I think it's the most easiest MCQs that we, ev we can ever get in history. Yes. Awesome everyone, the correct answer over here is option number A and all of you are absolutely correct. The greatest glory is living, lies not in never falling. It's not that you, you don't fall, but rising every time we fall. So that's the correct answer over here. Option A, even though we know that the non-cooperation movement which started earlier could not give us a result that people were looking for, we started with the civil disobedient movement. Right? With the hope that we'll be able to rise again and we'll be able to attain freedom. So option number A is the correct answer. Here let's moving ahead to the next question which is from the chapter The Rise of the Nationalism. But I want you to observe this image and tell me where you have seen this. Tell me everyone if you, ha if you are, you know, if you are through with the uh, NCRT, I'm sure you'll be able to spot this particular map that we have in which chapter and I just mentioned the name of the chapter also so yes very good very good so over here we have the painting of the Imperial Federation and the map is showing actually the extent of the British Empire in the year 1886 we have to observe the painting and answer the question that follows which of the following element this depict in the painting seems conflicting when presented together Yes, very good. Options are over here. Please take a look at the options. Option A is a British soldier and a British colony spread in both the East and West. The variety of animals and costumes figure depicting countries and their people. Britannica, right, a personification of Britain seated on the top of the word and the words Federation written on the top of the image. Or option D, in the words freedom and fraternity written at the top of the, at the top. And the atlas depict human labor holding the word upon their soldier, sol, uh, soldiers, sorry, shoulders. <laughs> yes, everyone. Very good. Yes, the freedom and the fraternity, absolutely correct. It's a conflict, right? They're, sh they are actually showing that we have freedom and fraternity. There's a brotherhood. We are together. There's a freedom of the, all the people. But on contrast to that, right, we can clearly see a man over here, right, a labor actually. It's a, it clearly shows a sign of slavery over here. So it was a conflict. Yes. Very good, everyone. So the correct answer over here is option number D. Everyone, this is an image. Right? Basically, this is a map that we have in our textbook. The last page, right, of the, uh, uh, the rise of the nationalism in Europe. The last page, we, we have this. So please make sure you go through it. Why not C? Because, see, it's not the conflict that we are showing. The question is asking... In the painting seems conflicting, conflicted when presented together. See, just imagine now, we are saying, Acha, we are very good, we believe in equality, we believe in this. But on the other side, we are showing that we are supporting slavery. Do you think that these points can come together? Yes or no? Tell me. Do you think that the freedom and the slavery can come together? Yes? Yes, absolutely. Yes, but you have to, you have to uh, look at the pictures that we have in the textbook. Radhika, I would request you to go back and uh, watch this question.
question again. In short, if I if you want, I can explain you that we have to look at this particular image that we have over here, and we have to find out, right? We have to find out what is a conflicting thing which is present in the picture that should not be coming together. Clear? Yes. And the correct answer over here is that word freedom and fraternity written at the top and at the bottom. They are showing a labor holding the word. Yes, Charlie. Okay, very good. Understood, right? Awesome. Thank you. All the best. All the best to each one of you who have their exams tomorrow and day after tomorrow also. Day after tomorrow, you'll not be having. It's a Sunday. <laughs> Maybe day after tomorrow. Okay. Moving to the next question, everyone. Let's quickly move ahead. Your time is very precious. We'll be calling Ashwarya Ma'am. Okay. No, so sorry, Ma'am. It's, it's printing culture only. <laughs> It's this time literally me and ma'am are discussing ma'am. I think this question belongs to your subject. No, no, this belongs to your subject. We do have a little bit of, you know, we took some time to understand the question and what they're asking. Half of the question we feel like are uh, coming from the deleted portions, <laughs> but they are not. Moving to the question of 14 everyone. Here we have, it's from the print culture. The distribution, application and the preservation of knowledge were the fundamentally altered with the invention of printing. That's a re first statement. Second statement, the reason is printing enables intellect to produce, comment on and evaluate text which spread the ideas across Europe. Right, we're talking about the print revolution which came, right? What do you think about these statements? Let's take a look at the assertion and we all know that in these we have to find the correct answer whether the statement are correct or not or the reason is the correct explanation and for the reason will you always ask why here the distribution application the preservation of the knowledge were fundamentally altered with the invention of printing we know that as we uh, as we move ahead in the time when we have more and more technology we saw that there was some alteration in the printing technique yes or no yes everyone so this is absolutely Correct. It's absolutely correct, right? Yes. And it's true. Then, printing enabled. Yes, we all know that printing actually helped. Printing actually helped the people to become, right? Uh, they can actually produce, they can write about it, they can comment about it, and they can spread the knowledge that they have across Europe. Yes. Based upon that, both the statements are correct. Those of you who are saying A, can you help me understanding why you are saying A? Right? Both the statements are correct, right? We all agree that both the statements are correct. Yes or no? Very good, everyone. Very good. Please stay focused. Why not A? Because both the statements are correct. We know that the distribution, application and the preservation of knowledge... We have, we, with the period of time, we saw that as the initial printing was happening, we saw that the technology was adding into it. So that's a correct statement. Then reason is also correct because we know that once the printing got into the picture, people now can express their thoughts, they can comment. Yes. So both the statements are absolutely correct and it's a correct explanation also. So option number C is the correct answer. Clear option number C will be the correct answer. Yes, everyone, I hope that you got it. Okay, ma'am, got it. Awesome. Ha. Very good, very good. Chali. Moving to the next question, everyone. And this is the political parties. Yeah, it's a from the... Yes, it's from the uh, political signs. Which of the following is a primary factor? Which of the following is a primary factor which contributes to the emergence of multiple political parties at the same level in India. What is the primary factor? What, what do you think, right? What do you think will be, uh, you know, the primary factor which will be contributing to the emergence of the multiple parties that we have? Is it a federal uh, federal political system? Or is it a, vari a, you know, in variety we have the economical condition? Or the language and the regional diversity? Or low level of literacy and the political awareness. It's a very easy and straightforward answer. We know that we have multiple we have multiple political parties. And what is the reason behind it? They are trying to connect with their people. So of course we have the regional diversity for sure. 
and of course you would have seen that leaders right uh, usually and the people of course usually prefer the leader who can speak in their mother tongue or the language which they are comfortable with hence option number c will be the correct option what is a prime factor for having so many political parties one option number c that is the correct answer over here the language and the regional diversity that we have in our country yes yes mohammad jahangir aapka naam le liya beta aap bataiye ab kya karenge focus in the class and all the best for your examination naam le liya maine to naam likha bhi tha right see we are we, we understand that you are here and you want us to wish we are doing that but i want you to stay focused now in the class yes very good absolutely correct chaliye moving to the next question everyone question number 16 here we go which of the following policies decision by the central government could potentially serve as a trade barrier i'm sorry ma'am this is your question <laughs> not my question <laughs> okay awesome so let's have a look at this which among the following policies okay which among the following following policy decisions by the central government could potentially serve as a trade barrier now is it strengthening export subsidies simplifying custom procedures implementing higher tariff on imports or promoting fairer trade practices now what are trade barriers trade barriers are basically certain restrictions or certain it could be in the form of laws that could restrict import export right now normally if there is ideally as per the world trade organization there shouldn't be any trade barriers so that that there could be easy trade amongst different countries thereby that would boost economies but still we see that there are trade barriers that still exist now which among the following could be a barrier that could affect my trading so simply if i want to trade with ankita ma'am and i want to you know um sell something to her but she says see if i have to buy what you give me you need to also give me this charge this charge and this charge right so in this particular case what would be the case we see that implementing higher tariff that means that see if you want to sell me if we want to let's say let's assume india wants to sell something to us i choose bakery ka products i want to open up in new york but if i have to do that then there might be some separate charges i might have to pay thereby what will happen the whole process will become a very expensive affair for me and i may or may not want to do that right which is why in this particular case we see that making sure that implementing higher tariff on import could serve as a trade barrier not d d is telling promote fair trade practices but how is that that is something which should be ideal but that is not serving as a trade barrier right that is why this is not the answer simplifying custom procedure is not acting as a barrier and strengthening export subsidies no not the case which is why correct answer is option c now before i go on to question number 17 no i want to stop for a minute and ask my students who are here now ankita ma'am and i both know all our regular students all new students everybody you all look very serious today you all feel you all you are giving us a vibe that you are little tensed little worked up that board exams are coming pre boards hai you are feeling are you feeling a lot of nervousness right now are you feeling a little stressed out at the minute be honest don't say ma'am it's okay we are solving paper we are feeling good no 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 be honest i am we are sensing nervousness through the chat to a point when it's i mean most of you are like See, be honest it's okay ma'am no ma'am ma'am yes ma'am ha huh. yeah no from the chat only we are able to get see normally you guys know you will be passing some comments or you'll be you know mocking the questions or you'll be mocking us if, if we fumble or something you you catch us and you like are ma'am you did this little bit gurlal it will come we are doing the testing for it so that you don't face issues next week it will be live for all of you ma'am little depressed Mama has devil fruit fruit bars. Yeah, I have devil fruit bars. Something which can read the mind, no? Maybe like Viola. But uh, I'm chilling. Okay, that's good to hear. But see, in general, right? Before we go on to the next set of questions, before I call Man, uh, Ankita, ma'am, let me tell you all something. See, I know it's very, it's it's very nerve wracking, right? To give these exams, to do your pre boards, 
Don't get worked up. See, don't be nervous, right? Take a minute. Don't stress yourself out saying, oh, yeah, pre I have to solve this paper. Then I have to go to the next thing. Then I have to go to the next thing. No. What's happening is when you're constantly doing that, you're not, you're only thinking about what is next. You are not really living the now of it. So take a minute, take a deep breath. You know the answers to it. You're all doing so well. Like Ankita Bam said, you guys are pro at it. And we know that it's going to be fine, right? Josh is Ultra Max Legend Pro. Exactly. So keep the Josh up high. Be ready for it. And you guys are going to ace your exams. So with a little bit of positivity, I need a lot of Josh, right? I need a lot of Josh. It's okay if your exams... See, if the pre-board exam marks went down, we should not feel bad that our marks went down. Okay, I went wrong here and there. Let me figure out. Let's take the learning from that. Because there's no time to feel bad. At, I mean, as much as you are, it's okay to have your feelings and feel bad about it. But there's no time to ponder much about, oh, this went bad and then go into that whole trip of it, right? Just be like, okay, now it's gone wrong, fine. Now I can't change my past. But I have a, lo a lot of potential to change my future and make sure how my future results come out, right? Which is why all of you have that positive energy. You guys are going to kill it and you guys are going to rock the exams. Nothing to worry about. With that energy, I'm going to call Angada Ma'am for the next question, which is going to be based on gender caste and religion, ma'am. I hope I got the chapter name right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Here everyone, we have the image-based question and we all know that we will have the image-based question either from the history or from the Paul science and so here we have the question. The question is, given below we have a cartoon created by the uh, Nilva Banerjee, a renowned Indian cartoonist and illustrator and a comic artist. We can clearly see over here a uh, woman, uh, she's carrying two matkas and of course there's a man who is uh, in the car I guess. She say, oh, she, she just, she doesn't work. She's a housewife. So the cartoon is trying to tell us something. So what is that? What is the cartoon trying to depict? Option A, the sexual division of the labor in India. Option B, natural and unchangeable gender division. Option C, incoming generating activities done by women in rural India. Or option D, the ability of men to contribute equally to Domestic work as women. Yes, everyone. What do you think will be the correct answer? Yes, majority of you are giving me the correct answer. And that, that is option number A, right? We know that in, in our country, and not just in our country, but different parts of the world also, we have sexual division of the labor in India. Especially with this particular picture we are speaking. We can clearly see that a woman is actually carrying two pots, two matkas, and the the person is saying that, oh, she she's not working, she is a housewife. So all of these activities that she is doing, they're not considered as a work. There's a very clear cut division of the genders in the society and what work they are doing. Yes, so I hope that all of you are clear. Good, very good. That's nice. Moving to the next question, everyone, and it's an economical question. The question from the economics, I have so many tables. So we'll be calling Ashwarya, ma'am. <laughs> next to her from here. Yeah. Okay, ma'am, will these questions come in both or could they be harder? Normally, it will be somewhere in between your sample paper ka easy questions and your practice paper ka hard questions. Cool. This is a very, this is little practical, okay? I mean, this is a little application. I give you it. I, I spend some time, but it's simple only. Let's go through the question. There is a table given to us, okay? And they've spoken about the statistics and the contribution of, let's say, the primary, secondary and tertiary sector to the economy of the country, right? So they're saying that in 2023, primary, uh, the primary sector has contributed 44%, uh, secondary has contributed 25%, and tertiary has contributed 31%. Now they're saying in 2040, what could be their contribution? Now their contribution could be in three scenarios. You have scenario one, Scenario 2, Scenario 3. Break the question down first, okay? Now, what are they asking? They are asking us, with all the factors remaining the same, that means that, let's assume there's no additional factor, like, let's assume there's no external change to this. Which of the following scenarios would have the biggest impact on global leadership? Ma'am, halwa question. If you're saying halwa question, I'm very happy. Now, what does the poll say? Lavne Lavinish. It's a very unique name. Are you referring to the question? It's not. It's a very simple one only. Alright. 
Okay, what do you think is going to be the answer? Now I told you how to interpret this question, right? Now see, if you're talking about global leadership, now I'm going to take a page out of globalization and we're talking about global leadership, yes? Now in this particular case, what do we see? We see that in this case, we observe that in order to be at a global standpoint where we are able to have a recognition globally, what would happen? We need to make sure that there's a lot of trade going on so that that boosts our economy. Now in order for trade to happen, right what should happen mainly right mainly there should be manufacturing that takes place of products and of course we see that there should be an impact in the tertiary sector right tertiary sector also services that we provide so that we see that globally we are able to grow yes now keeping that in mind look at scenario one two three hey this is hypothetical don't don't be like arey ma'am see primary sector has gone down no no look at it hypothetically yes now in scenario one, we see that although from 2023 primary sector has come down, there is a boost in secondary and tertiary. Similarly, in scenario three also, there is a boost in secondary and tertiary sector. But look at 2040, there is increase in primary sector. That means we are producing raw materials, agriculture is happening, it is booming. But those raw materials are not getting translated into secondary and tertiary. Now, if it is not getting translated into secondary and tertiary and there is a dip in manufacturing or dip in services, are we going to experience, right? Are we going to experience proper trade? Will there be boost in economy wherein we see that there is an impact in global le leadership? Hypothetical means, um, hypothet in Hindi, what do you say? Hypothetical? Hypothetical means what? Uh, hypothetical, it's not, it's it's not real. Imaginary. It's an imaginary thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Imaginary. Is it in our syllabus? It is an application of your contribution of primary, secondary and tertiary sectors. This is an application of how your primary, secondary, tertiary sectors contribute to GDP. Right? So based on this, you need to use logic. If we want to grow and it has little bit of globalization in it also. Now only hypothetical scenario one. Will that be the case where only if the hypothetical scenario is such, it is going to help? No, no. Even hypothetical scenario 2 is telling me more or less the same thing. Rather, there is a boost in tertiary segment also. Which is why it cannot be only 1. It cannot be 2 because there is a dip in the production. It cannot be 1 and 2 either. Which is why in this case, what do we see? It is answer D. Which could either be 1 or either be 3. And like I said, this is based on, we are not looking at any other external factors. Keeping things as is and looking at the data and in, in, inferring it, right? So just look at it. Ma'am, halwa hai kya practice kare bina kuch nahi aa gaya ma'am. Oh, see that means that Harish, your concepts are good. Like I said, if your concepts are good, you will be able to crack it. Now look at the next question. Now, same table based on this, which among the following statements is most likely to be correct. Option A says that in scenarios 1 and 2. So, let's have a look at scenario 1 and 2. Okay. In scenarios 1 and 2, the secondary sector would require the least number of workers. See, 2 may, okay, we can agree that maybe lesser number of workers should be employed in secondary sector. But can I say that for scenario 1, I uh, would also require less number of workers? No, na. as you see, look at it. If production or if contribution of secondary sector has increased, that means that more manufacturing is happening. If more manufacturing is happening, that means that more workers would be required. So no. Now next one says that, in scenario 2, India will become major service-based economy. How? In scenario 2, our service contribution, tertiary sector has come down all the way to 20% from 31. Are we going to become a major service-based company? No, we are not. Not a 20% contribution. Now, it's a scenario 1 and... Now, I'm going to jump because you know now why. In scenarios 1 and 3, okay. So, in scenarios 1 and 3, let's have a look. We see that maximum employment opportunities will be created in secondary sector. How can you say that? Only secondary sector, how can you say? Ha, those of you who are telling me, ma'am, answer D, hoga. Can you tell me it is D? That only, see, it's saying will be created in secondary sector. Is that the case? Is it D? You have your tertiary sector also, no, which is creating job opportunities. Because right now your tertiary sector has also contributed. 
which means what? It says that in scenario 2, we see that the primary sector will be the highest contributor of GDP. Yes, because 60% contribution is coming from primary sector. But here 2020 is only coming from the rest. So what is the correct answer? It is C. See, those of you who told me D, you guys are not wrong. You guys are not wrong. But why are you, why is that answer not correct? Because you guys have ignored our tertiary sector, poor things. Services you have ignored. Should not ignore, na? Which is why answer, oops, sorry. Answer is, op I made a mistake in that. Answer is option D, sorry. Okay, I will cross check this question, but looks like in this case, it should be on answer C, but I will cross check it once, right? Ha, ma'am, but maximum is option D, na? Ha, yeah. My bad, my bad. I interpreted the question wrong. My bad. Yes, you guys, I'm sorry about this. It says that one and three maximum employment opportunities will be created in secondary sector. So you have 45 plus 40 here, which is 85%. Here we have 30 and 45, right? Coming up to 80%, which is why in this case, highest is uh, secondary sector. My bad, guys. I looked at it the wrong way, right? Yes, it is in terms of total percentage. Yes. Okay. So it will be created in secondary sector. Okay. My bad. Sorry for that incorrect bit. I got, uh, I looked at the question wrong, even though I solved it correctly in my head. Yeah, ma'am, chalega. Ha, I know that is my line that I make mistakes sometimes. Minus 10 points for ma'am. Yeah, I will take that. But guys, correct answer is option D. So when I looked at it, I looked at it as a comparison between secondary and tertiary, but ideally I should have compared it with respect to percentages. I know ma'am ke saath moi moi ho gaya. Yes. But answer is option D. So I will give it to Ankita ma'am for question number 20 on elected representatives. Why not C? Why not C? Because here it's saying it will be the highest contributor to GDP, right? So even though it is the highest contributor, which is most likely to be correct, even though it is contributing GDP wise, we know that secondary and tertiary is low, right? Secondary and tertiary is low contribution. So overall, the gross domestic product that will come out of the overall country is not going to be much, which is why what is most likely to be correct, it is D, okay? Okay, now moving on to question number 20. Here everyone, last question. Here we have the last question. Last question of the FCQs in one hour. We will be done with this. Yay. Well, yes, it, yeah. Everyone, very good. Yes. Chali. In the representative democracy, Hamari Jesse democracy, mein, right? Which of the following best describe the role of the elected representatives? Right? Tell me everyone. In the representative democracy, which of the following best describe the role of the elected representative? Is it that they have absolute power and authority to make decisions without consulting the public? Or they are accountable to the public and make decisions on behalf of their constituencies? Or they act like their figurehead with no real power or influence in the government? Or option D, they deserve lifetime app appointment and cannot be removed from office. Ha <laughs> ha. Seems like e options are very uh, easy. <laughs> Very good, everyone. The correct option over here is option number B. Right? The people who are elected by us, right? They are responsible. They are accountable to the public, right? And the decision that they are making, they are actually making in behalf for us, right? And of course, on behalf of their constituency, the area that they have elected, they have been elected for. So everyone, are we clear? Straightforward answer. I feel that it's very, uh, it's, it's a good thing that we have over here. Yes, very good everyone, very good. Option number B is the correct answer. So with this, you know, we are done actually with the section A. And I'm just recalling back what Ashwara ma'am was, you know, having a discussion with you that th there is a time when we just very close to the examination, there are time when we feel a little bit of, you know, okay, are we ready for the examination? Everything is perfect now, we'll be able to do, we'll be able to score good marks, right? And now after some time, we will have some other, uh, other, I'll not say confusions, but other um, inquiries, right? That probably you will be looking for some other options. You, I'm sure majority of you have a plan. I'm sure nowadays we feel so proud that all of you have so much clarity that what you want in your life. Back then, if you ask me or ma'am, I think we were, uh, yeah, just going to the school and we don't know what are, what are the future that we are thinking for ourselves. So we're here and we want to help you with that. 
right we have an amazing workshop that will be happening we have a career counseling workshop workshop that will be happening on 10th of december especially for class 10th students so please make sure everyone to enroll into this workshop it's absolutely free we would encourage you to attend this workshop along with your parents praveen sir will be talking about how the things works and what you can pick or what you can actually discuss with the parents and it's a very amazing workshop i'm sure all your doubts that you have will be answered please make sure you ask your parents also to join so one hour workshop absolutely free the link of the workshop is in this in the description box click on that and join now this sunday is happening yes it's happening on this sunday which is 10th of december very good everyone very good song challenge mama are you ready end of class <laughs> we'll see if we survive till the end of the class we will show jolly everyone so are you ready for the section b everyone please make sure you enroll into the workshop moving to the section b now here we have section b section b okay we have consumer affairs maida wala rates ma'am it's over it's it's your question consumer rights right yeah but that deleted syllabus anyway okay so kids See, don't get scared looking at consumer rights because it's not there for board exam. Okay, consumer rights is not going to be there in board exam, but for some reason in this practice paper they have given it to you. So we are going to go through it very quickly. Yes, yes, all my Zoro fans and Luffy fans, get come to class. Consumer affairs raids Maida markets to check malpractices. Complaints were received that soft drinks were sold at a higher price. Which consumer right was being violated in the above instant with respect to soft drinks being sold at a higher price? So in this particular case, we see that soft drinks, soft drinks that were being sold, we see that the people were not informed about it. So right to being informed was violated here. And which is most likely to invoke a response on terms of um, invoke in response to complaint. We see that the right to sort of, you know, get re, uh, address it and seek re, re, uh, re, redress it, right? It is deleted. That is why I am not going to spend time. See, in your maths paper also, I am sure Kushmo ma'am would have told you that some of the deleted topics have come. So, because they are additional practice questions, they have given one, two, but nahi aayega. Don't get tense saying, ma'am, this deleted syllabus has come, which means that, you know, probably um, we should learn that also. No, no, it will not come. If you remember your sample paper, no deleted syllabus had come per se. More or less, SST was aligned. So, keep your sample paper as reference, right? Theek hai. Now we will go on to the next question, which I will hand over to Ankita ma'am, where Shruti performed a web search for teacher and found out that 80% had pictures of women. So ma'am, <laughs> over to you. Hello everyone. So we have a question on the gender, um, really gender, religion and caste. We have that question over here. And luckily, you know, from this particular chapter, in the previous sample paper also, and in this sample paper, in practice paper also, we don't have any difficult question. That's very good. There's a very, uh, very uh, twisted and confusing question from this particular chapter, which is that, okay, uh, how the politics and caste are involved or how the politics is there in the caste or caste is there in the politics. That's a whole confusion that we have, but we are very lucky. Yes, we are very lucky. Let's take a look at this question, everyone. We have Shruti, like you only, who has performed a web search of for the teachers, right? He just She just wrote teachers on the search engine and she got... 80% images of a women. In those images, they had women. And then she did a search for the pilot and mainly it showed the men. Discuss how the web search results reflect the society perception and the sexual division of labor. Explain with an example. Tell me everyone. Tell me. I'm waiting for your answer. Right? All of you stay focused. We will have the meetings. We will have everything. Great everyone that you talk, but please make sure in the class, just stay focused. What do you think? What this web search, right? What this web search that we have over here uh, tells us? Yes. Very good, very good. Nice, very good. So what we have over here, so basically it clearly shows that there's a lot of difference in the society, right? And for example, if for the uh, roles of the teacher, right? Especially if you think always about the teacher, we always think of a female, right? We always think about a woman because we think that they are considered as a more caregiving individuals and they're very suitable for the job. Yeah, they will be talking very sweetly, 
right? In your schools also, I'm sure you would have teachers. There are times when if the teacher is speaking really, very softly, probably the students will not be listening to her in the class, right? And in the role of pilot, what happens, they usually show uh, the men so that, you know, they can show that they are more physically strong, right? And mentally, uh, that particular job of pilot is mentally demanding. Yes, it's clear cut case of discrimination, absolutely. Now, again, we have an example. We can explain it more further with an example of a nurse. Nurse, may of course, if you look, we usually see women who are there, right? And uh, jobs like of engineer, we usually see the men are there. Now the scenario have changed, but if you go back, we uh, have such situation and such situation are still there in the varied interior part of our country. Okay, Charlie. So here everyone, this is how you can write the answer in your examination. Easy peasy, you can take a screenshot everyone. And of course, we'll be sharing the notes with you. Yes. Very good. Yeah, we are giving the example of Gunjan Saxena. Absolutely. Gender division, yes. Hello. Sukhana, yes, thank you. Chali, everyone, are we clear with this question? Nice. Congratulations to the topper of Tripura. Interesting name. Next question, everyone. Let's take a look over here. Examine the possible consequences on the basis of the rights of, pop, uh, rights of party member within the political organization that lack internal democracy. There are times, right, when people will say, Wow, we are there, right? Our party has so much of diversity. We have so young leaders. We have old leaders also. Both of these work together. But in the inside, we know that some of the people have no right to say anything. They will not be able to raise their opinion. They will not be able to say anything at all. And just in case, they even if they are well qualified, they will not be treated fairly. Yes, everyone? I am sure you would have seen this in a class. Elections also in class monitor or school elections also. Yes. <clears throat> Honey, if you can download the Baiju's uh, app, directly going on app store, write Baiju's, you'll be able to download the app. And for the notes, you have to download the Telegram group and then join uh, the group, which is of Baiju's 9th and 10th. There we'll be sharing the notes. Very good. So here everyone, we have two important points that we'll mention over here. It's a two marks question. First, Freedom of speech and expression is not there, right? Even if they have the qualification, or even, even though they are the member of the political party, they don't have a much say. Then right of equality of the opportunity, that's not there. In internal democracy is not there. So if there is the leader, and if he or she has a son or a daughter, so eventually, even though the children are not that qualified, the position of the head of the party will be going to them, not to the qualified leader sometimes. So we still see that in the political parties also we have a lot of uh, biasness. It's not, it's not uh, you know, clear democracy that has been followed in the political parties also. Yes, please ask your doubt what, what you have. Your, please do write your doubts everyone. Hello Sid. Yes, Sakshi. Let's focus everyone. Very good, very good. Yes, dynasty successions. Absolutely correct. So here everyone, you can write your answer in this particular way. We have two points, easy peasy, right? Okay. We have one more question from the multiple political parties. We, the, we have the or part of it, everyone. The or part of it. In the hypothetical democratic nation with a population that is religiously homogeneous. Homogeneous means same. It, everyone, let's just say focus. So in a hypothetical, hypothetical situation, just an imaginary situation, we have a nation where the majority of the population are following a similar religion, right? The question is, should this particular nation have multiple political party system? Yes or no? And we have to explain why also. Tell me everyone, why you think that? We should have multi-political party system even though in a place we have a population who follows a similar religion. And in short, basically the question is asking what are the advantages of the multi-political party system. Think about it everyone, we have more options, right? We have more parties, people have to perform, we have more options to perform, uh, from, we have more options to choose from. We have a greater, larger diversity of the individual who are standing in the election, right? So here everyone, we can write our answer in such a way. We have these three important points. 
but before that you know that we have three uh, we have different party system altogether we have single party system two party system and multi party system we have so many parties in our country we in our country we have a multi party system and why the multi party system is very beneficial why it is beneficial because it will be able to represent the diverse political perspective right different opinions can be put in out for the public apart from that it actually help in the uh, formation of the policies if we have only one particular party and who is just following one particular religion what will happen to the other minority who are there so if we have multiple party system it will be able to help people then of course to avoid the authoritarianism nobody should take the authority that okay this is the way we will be doing it we should avoid be avoiding that in an and in a multi party system it is possible last is to provide an alternative to the voters of course voters have their opinions they have their choices so if we have multi party system voters will be able to easily pick yes multiple choice absolutely correct we all have mcqs we all have mcqs yes sumit bachche by your doubt end of the class are kya so how are we able to drink water as hcl acid ha see again hcl acid is not present all the time once you have the food then it is released and it's not that it's like a bucket full small quantity it is released so that the, it can break the food chaliye thank you thank you alvina yes student ash okay okay yes in belgium we have multiple party system do we think about it yes okay everyone chaliye this is how you can write the answers over here and now of course we are calling ashwarya ma'am because i think we have a geography question yeah. i'm not able to identify it has it says india so i like geography <laughs> okay awesome all of you you can say that we have the video yeah the there's a one shot video for um gender yeah. religion and caste so you can watch that if government provides it to ashvi please ask ankita ma'am and she comes okay now we'll do geography question no, oh, okay so ma'am will take your doubt when she comes okay good evening to everybody who's just joined oh awesome we'll go to question number 24 yes as is the reasons for the concentration of woolen textile industries in the subtropical regions in india versus their absence in the southern part so here basically they're saying subtropical that means closer to the northern regions right so they're trying to say northern region versus the southern part of india why is it that we find more so this is my country why am i finding more in the subtropical regions when compared to let's say the southern parts which are closer to the equator regions hafiz bacha uh i think ankita ma'am told you where you can find the notes right yeah. ma'am agriculture and okay different climate ma'am climate is the problem doubt in geography you can ask me soil difference less water okay climate very good sajit very good neha sakshi av yes aradyansh uh, ashvi that to an extent the yeah, amount of rainfall see now textile industry in general right if you look at it when you talk about textile industries we know they contribute heavily towards industrial production employment generation foreign exchange right and if you look at any kind of industry some of the factors that it works on right is of course the kind of raw materials see primarily it is raw materials for any kind of industry now if you talk about it we're talking about the woolen textile industry what is a raw material it is the wool right and where do we get wool from we know that in order to get the wool we need to rear sheep now in the case of north india the climatic conditions are pretty ideal for rearing sheep while in southern india we see that the climatic conditions is not ideal which is why what do we see climatic condition is not ideal for rearing your sheep which in turn means that your uh, raw material is not going to be there yes you don't have enough raw materials to produce and along with that we see that the demand is not very high see to be honest let me tell you i have been born and brought up in south india and see bangalore is an edge case where it can be cold but it's nothing compared to the kind of cold that we experience let's say when you go to the northern parts of the country right especially places like rajasthan or if you look at himachal you look at let's say even delhi for a matter of fact it's much much colder when compared to let's say bangalore right which is why in such cases these two points you got to uh, what do you say related it does not mean we are talking about heavy woolen clothes right so because of climatic condition 
not enough raw material because of that we see that along with it there is no demand also hence this is the answer so when you are writing it right make sure that you have these two points written and you will get two marks for the same right so these are the important pointers ha ma'am low demand as exactly and we don't see even if we wear clothes that give us warmth we don't wear clothes that are woolen like thick woolen clothes right we don't need those heavy warm clothes that are there bio doubts towards the end everybody sumit please please don't mind but ankita ma'am has answered your question also very good avi yes many of you are sharing with us where you are from now we are left with section c and d right so before we go to section c and d ma'am how about we give a 5 minute break ma'am can we say colder regions uh, colder climate hence more demand yeah there yeah, you can say that okay so before we go ahead students can i give you a quick 5 minute water break if you don't mind i'm asking you because you are the ones who need the break so shall i give you a quick 5 minute water break before we start section c and d because as i all know right section c and d are actually very hefty hefty questions are there that is why 5 minutes okay i am reducing this to 2 minutes 2 minute water break and come back so even if you don't want it take it 2 minute water break and we'll be back and then i think uh this is my question only in section c so i will be back in 2 minutes take that water break is that so are silly mistakes you know when you say silly mistakes what i will say no silly mistakes happen when we are in a hurry so don't be in a hurry to do silly mistakes i mean don't be in a hurry to give answers aaram se aaram se give the answer and it's okay if you made silly mistake in pre board next pre board you will make it up so don't worry about it so i will quickly take a one minute water break and be back okay i am back are it's okay ashwi next time be little more careful okay i'm um, do we have sample papers in telegram group but our sample paper is available on the cbse website but if you want me to post the link i will post that um ma'am why why india buys imported clothes even though we have a lot of cotton see one thing is imported clothes that come in right it could be due to brands it could be in order to improve trade in order to build the economy build, get in more jobs we see that sometimes we have imported clothing brands as well right okay my god ma'am get ready for i am very bad at singing i'm telling you cool shall we get started then two mark two minutes ho gaya time to get started is the josh hi today josh is feeling little low on lower on the side but yeah ma'am can we promote absolutely see that's why as you grow older you will start to promote home grown brands right they call it as home grown brands because that way you are promoting your indian entrepreneurs you are building our country so that is why it is advised that you build on what is produced from our country yes okay ma'am we are Okay, cool. Let's get started. Now I need to shoot up my Josh. I feel like my energy is lacking a little bit today, so I will shoot up my Josh and let's get started. Yes, cool. Let's have a look. Look at this question. This is a competency-based question, so this is not direct. It is indirect. A drought-induced water shortage can have far-reaching consequences, which affects agricultural productivity. It affects food resources. It affects your industrial activity, livelihood. Thereby, it can affect the overall human well-being. Right now, the question is asking us: How does the above statement represent relationship between different resources? And you need to give me two examples, or for two marks, we will have to write the answer for. Now, you look at this particular question. It is telling that if there is a water shortage. 
So now we are experiencing water shortage, right? Now, if there is a water shortage in an area due to drought, what can happen? They are telling us that it will affect the agricultural productivity. So agriculture has now gotten affected. Now, agriculture is our primary sector, which means that in this particular case, agriculture provides raw material for industry. It is also food for all of us. We get food from this and it affects various other factors, right? Very good, exactly. So in this case, what do we see? They are all, it represents the interdependence or how each of this is interdependent to each other. So in this particular case, if there is not enough water, then food will get affected. Then we see that a negative impact, if agriculture gets affected negatively in any manner, we are the ones who suffer the end hood, right? Or the end result of it. We may feel like Are, agriculture mein toh koi problem hai. how does it affect? I am just sitting and studying here. No, we indirectly are at the receiving end of it because if agriculture gets affected, food resources get affected, which means now we don't have enough food to you know give people. If manufacturing industries get affected, then we see that it Im immediately impacts the economy of the country, right? So in this case, we see that these are the two pointers that you will have to write. It will affect the service also. Exactly. Very good. Sharad, I told you know this came in your exam 3. Half the time questions in pre-boards are going to come either from your sample paper or these practice papers. Which is why solving is very very important. Good. Next up the second part of the question is asking us how does a sit such a situation represent lack of resource planning. See, we know what is resource planning, wherein first we take stock of how much resources we have, then you utilize them wisely. Now, clearly, utilizing them wisely has not happened. We have not managed water in such a way because ideally, if there was a drought, we should have had some backup, right? Some way in which there was enough water that gets provided to these drought affected places. But clearly, we have not managed our resources properly and as a result, we see that there is still dependency on the monsoon. There are no proper irrigation plans which have been set up for this area. Because if that irrigation plan was set up, then you see that even despite, uh, let's say, monsoon or whatever it be, we will be able to get the water, right? So in this particular case, we see that there is no proper water management. Rainwater harvesting is also not practiced. But here, Ashvi, they are just saying that we are talking it with a hint of resource management. So remember you are connecting two chapters, your water resources chapter along with how you develop and manage resources. Yes? Very good, Saujit. Very good. Ma'am, is there any mock test? We are bringing a mock test which will be live. Ma'am, should we solve PYQ sample paper or this year's alone? No. PYQs are very, very important. But along with this year's sample papers because your pre P PYQs will not have enough competency questions. So for the competency based questions, this year's practice and sample papers will give you a better idea. Balu, basically, if there's not enough water, why is there no enough water? Because nobody has managed the water properly. Yes? See, can you explain the question once? Simple. They are saying that in some place, there was a water shortage and because it was drought, what, why does drought happen when there's not enough rainfall, right? Now, because of that, it has affected agriculture. It affected how much food was being produced because of agriculture. It affected industry. So, they are saying because there is drought induced because of, say, less rainfall or climate, climate change that has happened. They are saying how does this impact or what does this tell about resource planning? It means that in this area, we have not planned the use of water wisely. So there is lack of water management. Yes? So that is what we mean by this. So when you are writing the answer, they have given you the mark split up, right? So they have given you two marks for the first part and one mark for telling how we have not managed the water properly. Yes? So are we clear? Ma'am, should we by heart everything? No. Learn it in a smart way. Don't sit and buy, buy heart everything because you're bound to forget. So for agriculture chapter, I told you, you need to remember climatic conditions and all of that, which is why what I would represent, what I would suggest is learn, take five, six major states where you find that are common, right? Remember the kind of climatic conditions we find there. What is the rainfall pattern? Then group your crops under each of it so that you're able to remember it. Yes. Okay. Now we will move on to the next question which is based on federal system. So I will call Ankita ma'am for this particular question. Over to you ma'am. Yeah. 
Here everyone, we have the next question. Question number 26. Now I feel that we are moving Aram Sena. Right ma'am, we will be able to finish off on time. Yes. <laughs> yes ma'am. <laughs> awesome everyone. So let's take a look at this particular question. Uh, this is question number 26. It's a two marks question. We are, no, sorry. It's a three marks question. Discuss the most likely impact, right? What is the most likely impact if India started operating without the federal system? So we know that we have federal system in our country, right? All of us agree that we have federal system in our country. What will happen if in India we don't have the federal system? We have to write our answer by considering these three points. First, of course, we have to think about the regional autonomy, right? If we just have one region and if they take the all, all, all power altogether. Effectiveness in the governance, how the, govern, the government that will be formed will be effective. And the last, how, if the federal government is not there, how the decisions will be taken. So everyone, are we clear with the question? The question looks a little bit complicated, but trust me, the question is really very easy. Yes, everyone, I hope that you can see me. I can't see your chat and I hope that you're typing something. The chat is not moving, is it? Ah, yeah, yeah, yes, it's moving now. Yes, right, the question, uh, I hope that all of you are clear with the question. So let's understand what is a federal system first of all, right? It's a halwa, halwa, it's a halwa question, very good. Okay, what is a federalism or what is a federal system? In federalism, we have studied that we have a system of a government where the the authorities is not with the center, right? They have distributed the power across. So, in a, it is a system of the government in which the power is divided between the central authority and the various constituency units of the country. Different, different level pay. The power have been divided. It's a division of the power. Easy? That's what we understand by the federal system. Just in case, if we don't have federal system in our country, the question wants us to write what will be the situation considering three important points. What will be the thing if we have regional autonomy? Regional autonomy as I clearly mentioned over here is that we just we are just talking about one individual or one person who has all the power. Do you think that in such government, if we have such government, do you think that it'll, it is good for the country? Yes or no? Yes or no, everyone? Nice. Very good, Anis. Very good. Awesome, everyone. I can see your answers. Awesome, everyone. So, regional autonomy. We can. What are the points we can write? It. If we have the regional autonomy, what will happen? There will be no decision making, right? Only one person can take the decision. If we have a regional autonomy, what will happen? If this is a region which have a more number of population, they will take the decision for everyone. So that clearly sees that, uh, clearly shows that there is no democracy. Then there will be no decision making and regional aspiration might be lost. And sometime we can easily suppress. If we have two regions who are fighting, probably the one region which is weaker can be easily suppressed also. Yes? Then what about the governance? What do you think? The governance, how do you think the governance will be getting affected if the, there is no federal system? Tell me. Yes, it can be asked in your board examination also, in your pre-board examination also. We are just for a practice. Minorities, yes, minority voice will not be heard. Effectiveness, yes, government have to focus on the important things. Absolutely correct. Yes, what will happen in the governance? If we don't have a federal government, right, if we don't have a federal government or if we don't have a federal system, the governance will be getting affected. What will happen? Local issues might not be reaching, right? My, local issues might not get even the attention. There will be ignorance for the minority. There will be the leading difference between the grassroots reality and the governance, right? For example, if there is no power sharing, the central government will not be aware about what is happening in the local government. It is because of the division of power that they are aware about so that they send funds, they contribute. But just in case, if we don't have a federal system, what will happen? Upper people, upper government is not even aware about what is happening in the villages. And hence, their issues, their concern will be completely unheard or completely ignored. Everyone, are we clear? That's a second point. 
that how the governance will be getting affected if the federal system is not there. Last point everyone that we have to write the decision making. Tell me what will be the decision making situation if we don't have a federal system. Yes. But you always in SST write break your answer into the points. You know the answer try to write the answer in the points. When you write the answer in points you are covering each and every, uh, every important keywords over there. So that's how you'll be able to present it better and underline the important points. No quality, no quality decision will be taken, right? There will be a lot of um, issues that will be faced. Absolutely correct. So let's take a look everyone over here. What will happen if we don't have a federal system and how it will be affecting the decision making? The decision making process might become very undemocratic and less inclusive, right? Probably we will not be participating in decision making. We will not be casting a vote because nobody will ask us. The one who is sitting at the authority can take all the decision. If there is no federal system in the country. Hence it is very important to have a federal system in our country. Not just in our country but throughout the world. We have so many other countries which follow the federalism. Where, where the power is being distributed. Very good everyone. So take a screenshot of this everyone. This is how we can write the answer in the examination. Right? We have regional autonomy, right? Uh, then we have the effectiveness of the governance and we have the decision making process. These three points everyone are mentioned in the question itself. Dekho bacho, aise jab, uh, question jab na, just remember one important thing. Read the question thoroughly and see what the question is asking. It was a very simple question, right? The question is just asking what will happen if we don't have a federal system? You know the advantage of federal system. You know how the federal system actually help in the individual in all of these. In these three categories. You just have to write the opposite of it. Good ka bad likhna and that's it. Yes. There's a trick to remember all of these. You know the correct answer. You know the important features and then how you can use those features in different ways and different questions. That's one thing. The more you practice, the more you will learn. Yes, Sangeeta, I can see that you are facing issues with the learning of the dates. But there is only one way. Is to relate it to things that we keep on telling to uh, all of us and to everyone. Is that start re relating dates. I do always, for example, if I am visiting some place, I will be like, you know, if I was present at the past. Okay, this is a date I will remember. This is how I will walk. Clear? This is how I will be protesting uh, for the freedom of a country. So try to recall, reconnect things with the date. Done? Yes, Neha ji, kya baate chal rahi hain? Haan? Son ji, kamo. Let's just focus bachi in the class. Ma'am, board paper tough hoote nahi hoota hai. Aapne sab itna achse se padh liya hoota hai ki paper easy aega. Believe in yourself. Hana, jo cheez hamne dekhi nahi hai, uske baare mein abhi kya soch ke karenge? It's okay, paper will be easy. Chaliye. Moving ahead everyone, moving ahead to the next question and we will be calling Ishwarya ma'am. Because we have Indian Railways. <laughs> okay, so we have... <coughs> I think we have about 10 questions left. But see, ideally this should not come. This question on Indian Railways and if you look at lifelines of Indian national economy, as per your syllabus, as per your current syllabus, there shouldn't be many questions coming from this chapter. But yet, like I said, if we have questions from consumer rights, then this is also something we are going to experience. So don't get worried looking at this question. We'll go through it very simply. Okay. Now, look, this question, although may not be per se about the Indian Railways, it is about, don't, ha said, not yet. Because this question is more about public versus private sector. Now, public versus private sector is something that you have in Indian economy. I mean, sectors of Indian economy, right? So, if you look at it from that chapter's view, then you can at attempt this particular question and that's how we are going to do. So, statement 1 says that Indian rail railways has been largely a public sector enterprise. Statement 2 says that private players are making an entry into the Indian railway market. This is not deleted. That is what I am coming to. You may look at it as lifelines of national economy which is why I sort of set the term straight. Because the or question I think is there for this or I think in 5 marker which is deleted. But this is something that can be there in your board exam because it is from the chapter sectors of Indian economy. And this is something which you know how to write. 
they are asking you based on statement 1 and 2 reflect the way in which the railway sector is working right or reflect in the railway sector in india now look at it look at this chapter i mean look at this question it's talking about how what is the role of public and private sector now public sectors we know is something which is owned by the government and of course we know that the main intent of public sector is so that they contribute to the national development while a private sector for example if i decide to open aishu bakeries i am owning it right which means that it is owned by a private individual and it's mainly profit making so we know that the intent in a private sector is to make profit and if a private sector has to get involved in a public sector like the railways right so mainly they are saying indian railways has largely been in the public sector enterprise so mainly indian railways has been owned by the government now what are they saying that private players are making an entry that means private players like for example now today i have aishu bakeries tomorrow i want to have my own railway company so i decide to sort of start investing money into this what would happen what do these statements mean so first and foremost if private companies come into the picture if private companies come into the picture we know that we know that first and foremost we will get good quality see i don't want to build a railway which is not going to give me good see why would i want to have a railway let's say few few trains which have poor service no i would want to give top notch service and i want to make sure that it would be not like the normal railways but it has some fancy things for all of you so that you guys would want to sort of be involved in it right that oh the, you know that train is really good it's giving me a good experience i want to go back so on the positive side we see that service quality would be enhanced right and this also means that people have more choices now trains may also they will have more choices which is again good for the customers end but what is also not good it means that if i get involved in this it could also mean that it could become little expensive than normal because i am a private individual i am investing money yes i am investing money into making trains and extra services which means that i will want to get that money back so now what will happen train tickets will become slightly costier costlier than normal right so we see that here we also see that it could be that it may become unaffordable to the larger masses that could be one point of it but nonetheless i am investing money which means that i am investing money in a public infrastructure so at an overall point of view i am contributing to the growth right growth of the national economy how because end may there is a tie up between a public and private organization and profits that come in can be utilized for the public infrastructure also means that we would also see that that also means that there would be more employment opportunities as well so are you clear with this are you clear see it was not direct right it is not very direct but are you all clear so quickly to look at it we see that it represents what does it represent a growing trend between public and private partnership which means that if a private company gets involved better service better quality more choices but it would also mean that there is investment in public infrastructure thereby we see that things may become unaffordable for people of the poor like like say people who cannot afford it and it would also mean that the government must take up some steps to make it affordable so thereby it is not per say very advantages right it has its advantage and it has its disadvantage ma'am should be right both yeah you have to write both because they are saying reflect what would happen to the sector which means you can give both okay as uh, asgar see they are asking you if private and public sector tie up what are the advantage and disadvantage that is what they want to know what are the advantage when public and private sector ties up advantage is that of course people are getting more choices better service better quality disadvantage is that it could be expensive yes all for three marks i know right anyway next is also easy peasy question so let's have a look at this particular question so in this question explain which sector the organized or unorganized sector is preferable for employment explain three marks easy peasy question laddu question i am sure you can all give me the answer to this right we need to tell which is preferable for employment organized or unorganized now this is ha see simple now why organized you need to tell me 
we know that in the case of organized sector we see that they are registered with the government we know that they have job security they have laws which are implemented by the government they work for a fixed number of hours they have basic conditions points you have only points to write for this but now you know in the marking scheme what they have done marking scheme may cbse is like if my children want to write say no unorganized sector is preferred for employment they have given you the answer for that also now ideally answer if you write saying organized sector it is the easier choice but we see that there are some um, very smart people who may think no ma'am i want to write unorganized sector so if you are among those people who want to write for unorganized sector you can say that if you work in an organized sector like maybe a gross maybe you want to open up a grocery store or maybe you want to you know let's say there are people who want to have their own shops open in such cases we see that there is flexibility in work you can there is no uh, punch in punch out time you can start your work whenever you want to yes and you can escape some paperwork as well right so sometimes in order to let's say let's when you have a established organization working for the government there are a lot of extra procedures which you can cut out on and employment is quick you are doing your own job which means better in employment it has its advantage but see exam point of view pe writing answer for uh, organized sector is the easier route take the easier route right so which is why i would recommend this answer and write any three points from what we discussed you will get three marks yes ha see in this escaping paperwork does not mean black money scamming and all of that okay don't think of it that way so making that very clear okay coming to question number 29 discuss the role of newspapers in shaping public opinion and democratization of information during the modern period which means i will hand it over to ankita ma'am for the same ma'am someone wrote ma'am it's a question uh, lapusa question economic lapusa <laughs> yes everyone so here we are yes <laughs> Okay, so the question that we have is related to the newspapers. Now, newspapers, while a part comes in the print culture, while a chapter may, and it's 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 a very, I'm not able to point out which chapter we have specifically because we have such uh, information in uh, the making of the uh, global, the making of the global world, and of course we have the importance of publication in the both the chapters in the first chapter as well in the second chapter, but it's a print culture question. The question is. discuss the role of a newspaper in shaping the public opinion and the democratization of information during the modern period so what are we looking over here we are looking about why the newspapers are very evident and why they are important at that particular time in spreading the information what do you think everyone help to create a world of debate and discussion very good Yes, very good. They give people a new way of thinking and keeping them informed about what was happening around the government. Yes, easy peasy. Yes, people can. Uh, people can read and write. They can express their views. Very good, right? We saw that there was a distribution of the. We saw that easily there was a distribution. We saw there was a distribution. We have the distribution of information. Yes. Then of course we, uh, we have over here we have the distribution of the information we have the shaping of the public discussions right a lot of public uh, public dis uh, discussions uh, debates are happening two people are writing in the columns right so when people are reading about them they are understanding and they are becoming aware about the different opinions people have yes and of course we have increased awareness. Mohammed bache this question you want me to explain again i am explaining you again one uh, let's just focus over here the question is very straight forward very simple for three marks we have to discuss the role of newspaper in a very layman language if i ask you why the newspaper are important during the modern period adding a new word over here during the modern period during our the time of the struggle that we are you know uh, we are struggling for the freedom why you think or why you feel that that newspapers plays a very important role first of course they actually help in the distribution of the information when you read it people can actually be aware about what are the different opinions we have then we can share the public discussions also and most importantly it's actually help us in the increasing the awareness sahi baat hai na you read newspaper you become aware about okay this movie will come we have this movie over there or okay this minister has said this you know what we will be having games at that particular time 
So what happens that newspaper becomes the very good uh, medium through which people can become aware. Easy peasy. So this is how everyone you can write the answer. So you will have three points. Any three points you write and your pockets in your marks. So with this everyone we are done with the section C. Now are we ready for section number D? Yes are we ready for section D everyone? Prisha, I'm not sure, but I'm not aware about that paper, so I don't know if it's easy or tough. I don't know. Jatin, the legend, bache, stay focused. Notes will be getting the notes on the uh, you'll be getting the notes on the Telegram. Yes. Everyone, I hope that all of you are clear with the questions that we have discussed now. Give me a quick thumbs up in the chat. Jaldi Lise Bataye, I hope that all of you are clear, right and I, uh, if you are coming to the class, come with the intention and with the motivation that you will be clearing your doubts and you will be staying focused in the class. Done, right? Awesome. Okay, I can see smileys. I can see thumbs up everyone. Please make sure you hit the like button for the video. Yes. So we have three sections which are remaining. Section D which has uh -huh, five marks question. Then we have section E which have case based study question. And our favorite, right ma'am? My favorite. My favorite section throughout the paper is section F because we just have two marks of history. <laughs> Map fuck there. Chalye. Let's take a look everyone at question number D and uh, seems like ma'am. Okay, okay, it's a history question. We're talking about the civil disobedient movement over here. We have to examine the significance and key milestone of civil disobedient movement that took place in India during the struggle of independence. Easy everyone. Right? Chalye. Right. Get ready everyone. Get ready. We have to examine the significance and the key milestone. What are the milestones that were achieved? We are actually basically talking about the events. What events happened? And what was the outcome of these events, right? For example, we have Dandi March. So what was the intent? What That was an event. And of course, what was the significance of it? So we are looking for that particular thing in this particular answer. We are talking about the civil disobedient movement. So it happened later after the non-cooperation movement. So let's see everyone. Everyone, you can take a screenshot of this. Jaldi se. Jaldi se, you can take a screenshot of this. So we have few important points over here. Inish, before the, uh, before the civil disobedient movement came into the picture, there were a lot of turmoil throughout the world because of the economic depression. Then we have Swaraj Party, Simon Commission came, uh, came to our country. There was a negotiation which was happening between Irwin and the Gandhiji. At that particular time, Gandhiji wrote a letter to Irwin, right? Asking for the demands. He said that one of the important demands that you have to listen to me is, Please remove the salt tax. Yes or no? And Irwin said no reply and Gandhi did the Dandi march. So one of the important events that we will remember over here everyone is the Dandi march. So Dandi march was a key milestone that happened. We all know that Gandhi ji marched right from Sambarmati to Dandi and there of course he made the uh, salt and broke the law. Clear? So this is a very, very important milestone that we have in the civil disobedient movement. Along after that, we have the repression and the imprisonment. We know that once there was a starting of the civil disobedient movement, what happened? We saw that the Britishers are becoming a little bit restless at that particular time. Now they are arresting our people and putting them behind the jail. Then during that time only, a lot of negotiation was happening. But there was no outcome of those negotiations. We clearly remember about the Evin and Gandhiji discussion, right? And second round table conference also. Clear everyone? So even though the discussions are happening, the negotiations are happening, there was no result. So these are the important events. The significance are over here. That there was a mass participation. What was the significance? As an end, Gandhiji participated. Gandhiji initiated this uh, Dandi march. So many people came into the support, right? They started boycotting the British goods. 
Then there was a spread of the nationalist idea throughout the country. People were so determined that now is time for us to make our country free. Last but not the least, legacy and the inspirations. People got inspired to follow through. Everyone, are we clear? Done, 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 everyone. I hope that all of you have taken the screenshot of this. Yes, all the things are mentioned over here. See, second round table. British broke the negotiation, right? Clear? So everything is, we, we have it over here. Okay, chali. Moving to the next question, everyone. Next question we have, we have the or part of it. We will share the notes so you don't have to worry about it. These we have. Next question, everyone. Again, we have it on Satyagraha from the same chapter, the rise of the nationalism in India. Read the following text that we have over here and then we have to read it and then we have to understand. Clear? The constitution of India guarantees the fundamental right to protest, which is derived from the broader rights of freedom of speech and expression and freedom to assemble peacefully. However, this right is subject to a reasonable restriction in the interest of the Indian sovereignty. Violent action during the protests are in a violation of citizen fundamental duties, emphasizing that the right to protest encompass only peaceful demonstration. So in short, everyone, everyone, those of you who are saying map, case study, bhaiya, ruk to jao. Step by step chalenge na. Tell me, can you skip a stairs? Matlab, aap siri chad rahe hote ho. Can you skip one, acha, ek, sta ek jo stair hota hai, ek step hota se aap skip kar doge. What about the other? You, you, we will go in an order. We will go in an order, right? Yes, we will go in an, in an order. Jump karne ki kya zarot hai? You are here till the end, right? Satyagre and the current constitution. Let's take a look, everyone. So we know that Gandhi ji is the one who started the Satyagre in our country. Where? Of course, he means that we will not be doing any violence. It was non-violence and it was a peaceful protest against the Britishers. Gandhiji will sit and will not hurt anybody, anyone, right? And of course, he'll be requesting other people also not to hurt anyone. So, of course, he did various Satyagraha throughout the country. This is a very crucial question that all that actually come in the examination. He started the first Satyagraha. He went to the Champaran in the 1917. Then, of course, in the 18, he went to the Khera and in 1918 only to the Ahmedabad, right? And he did Satyagraha over there. The question is asking us that what are the elements of Satyagraha which do you think that are, they are valid for our today's constitution, the things that are written over there? Yes? Yes, okay, tell me. Okay, wait. There is a lag. Everything is fine now. Harsh, I will repeat, but can we focus? Everyone, I hope that everything is perfectly fine. There is no lag. I am repeating, I am repeating the question. But are we clear? Haan, aaj laddu nahi khilaye hain. Khilayenge, khilayenge, abhi khilayenge. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, Charlie will be finishing up the class really very soon. But in simple, in short, if I tell you, what are you asking? Satya Grah log pehle karte the. Wo jo Satya Grah ke rules the. Abhi humare constitution ke rules se align hai ya nahi. Humare constitution mein rules hai ki hum kis tarikhe se protest kar sakte hai. The question is very simple. Do you think that the rules and regulations of the Satya Grah that was performed during the before, before the independence and the one which is performed now, the normal protest that we have, can, do we have some alignment between these two? Can it work in today's world also? The question is this, right? So we know that there are certain elements of the Satyagraha that may go against the Indian constitution. For example, during the act of civil disobedient movement, right, they were actually breaking the laws. So that will not be entertained now. Do you think that you can go out and break the laws? Tell me. Is it, haan, aisa hai ke bas, haan, aaj to humara, aaj hum bahar ja rahe hai, aaj humara man hai protest karne ka and we are damaging something. Can we do that? No, right? No, we cannot do that. So, or do it without consequence. Huh, or we do it without consequence. We don't know what are we doing. In uh, in rage, we do that. Right? Ra rage oh, is the right there word. There is a consequence. Huh. Yes, so that's not a good thing, right? We don't know what are we doing, and sometimes we just just because someone has said we will go. Ha 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 ha. We will be participating in this. 
Yeah, then you will be going to the jail. I don't know why I start doing this X symbol. Look like Kilwish that we used to watch in when I was a kid. Shakti Man, I'm not sure. Feels like sometime very aged when we talk about such cartoons. I'm not sure whether you are aware about Shakti Man and the villain characteristics feature. Yes. Okay, chali. Next part is that additional satyagraha techniques that obstructs essential services will be hindering the governments and of course the way the government works. Okay? Clear? Okay, chali. So this is how everyone you can write the answer. You can mention about the points. The elements of the satyagraha definitely they are good. But in terms of today's constitution, there are two points which will be hampering with the working of the government. Chali. Yes, very good, very good. Next question, everyone. We have a think tank. Think tank. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, this is us only. This is us. Okay, this is from the political science. <laughs> I'm a think tank. Okay, I'm calling Ashwarya, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Yeah, XD Lord. Yes, the only thing I remember about the Shakti is spelling. Same here. <laughs> and there was a villain in that. Kilvish. He used to do like this. So, yeah, I remember that. Yes, Kilvish. He's more. He's more. Okay, a think tank that has been given a task to design an outline to measure how successful has a democracy been in any country. We have to discuss any key indicators that will be helping the think tank to design, right? And we have to explain why these factors are crucial. But this question is very easy. Question kuch nahi hai, was ghuma diya, jalebi hai. Literally this question is a jalebi. But this question is a jalebi question. Why in a very short word the question is asking us to tell what are the good ways, right? Or how we will be able to identify whether in a country the democracy is running successfully. Easy peasy. We just have to tell what are the advantage of democracy. So let's take a look everyone over here. The important thing that we have to remember is that the one way to measure the successful democracy in any country is to see whether they have Free or fair election. There should be free and fair election. No discrimination in the election should be there. Election should be free. Nobody should be bribing other people. An election should be conducted in a way that all the peoples have the equal opportunity to vote. Then, right of information. People should be aware about what the government and the other parties are doing. They should be aware about what is happening in the country. In a democratic government, people can question, so they should be able to question. Yes? Right of minority rights. Now, the government rights should be taking the responsibility of protecting the minority in the countries also. Not just the children, we are talking about minority, we are talking about a small population of the community. So, a successful government or a successful democracy in any country will be protecting the minority rights. They will be treating them equally, will be giving them opportunity to grow, will be providing them essentially all the things that they need to flourish in the country. Yes, and to grow in society. Done. You can write, ma'am, we can't write, ma'am, can't we write the features? No, bache. We cannot write the features directly. Right? We have to twist little things. Paying attention also like us. Wow. Nice. Wow. <laughs> okay. Reduction in the poverty. The clear indication, right? Uh, if a government is working, right? If the government is working in well in a country is, in the country we will see reduction in the poverty because the government is working for the people they are actually not just developing the country but they are providing the economical development for the people also so we will see that there's a reduction in the poverty last but not the read least there's a rule of the law laws are followed it's not that a country where everything is done by people ha bhai aaj mera man hai ki i will not take class it's not like that there there will be a certain laws Is it paused? Ah, uh -huh, now it's fine. Now wait, it's fine. Wait, wait, wait. Can you do something? Yeah. Tung, 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 tung. Tung. Uh -huh. tung, tung. Yeah, I think they will be able to hear. Just yes, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Now it's all clear. Yes, seems like all good now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So are we clear? 
So first of course, if we have to check in a country, we should have free and fair elections, that they are happening free and fair elections. We should, uh, the in a country, we, there should be right of information, protection for the minority rights, uh, rules and regulations should be followed, and we should see the reduction in the poverty. Okay. Here we have, with, we are done with this everyone, and here we have the next question, and then we'll be calling Ashwarya ma'am. This question is a little bit trickier. Now, uh, the answer which was written in the sample paper marking scheme is a little bit jalebi. Guma Firake diya and they just mentioned the two marks, only two sentences for the important points. So let's take a look at the question. Free and fair media, we are not talking about the election over here, we are talking about media. We all understand that media plays a very important role in the elections. Yes or no? Batao, do you think, do you believe that media plays a very important role? Yes or no? Answer should be yes, right? Media plays a very important role. Now we have to write and we have to comment basically that the free and fair media is one of the most important outcomes of democracy. Media actually help us to understand about the democracy, how it is working, whether it's good, whether it's bad. Right? So we have to express our opinions over here. Now, if we go with the... Uh, Marking scheme, they have gone into details and they have talked about the democratic government. That, okay, what are the different uh, ways we can say that the government is free and fair media? Do we? Okay, now we're back. Okay. Okay, everyone, tell me how we can say that uh, the government is accountable. Jaldi say. I, I was uh, looking at earlier also you mentioned, right? Tell me, when we can say that the government is accountable, we can clearly say the government is accountable when people have a right to choose their ruler and of course we can actually control whether a ruler is doing correct or not. Control over their rulers, right? If they are not performing, probably next time will not be electing them. So, an accountable government is someone, is something that where people can choose their leader. Citizens have a say in the decision making. We can definitely put out our opinions there, right? And this way, democracy is a government which is accountable to the, to the citizens. We know that the government is accountable because we are the one who is electing it, right? We are the one who will be raising a voice for the, for the decision making. The government has to listen. That shows that they are accountable. Clear with this? But so in this question, please do pay attention. This question can come otherwise also. It's very, very important. Second point is the responsive. How we will find that a government is responsive? First important point. They ensure that decision making is based on the norms and procedures. In our country, we have so many laws and procedures and policies. So accountable government, a true government will be following all of these norms and procedure. For example, right, if I want to find out something, I'll be able to find out how the government is working. Very good. Citizen have a right to examine the process by which the decision making are made. Absolutely correct. Right? Sometime we know that the government will take some time to respond. More than that, democracy often frustrates the needs of a people and ignore their demand. Because it's a very huge process, it has various norms, procedures and policies, sometimes it takes a lot of time for the democracy, right, or the government to understand what is the need of the citizens. And that act can be a very frustrating for various people. That's very true. Then, we all sometimes hear about the corruption in the government. That is also a setback. But overall, we know that a democratic government is responsive. They have to respond. They have to be transparent. Very good. Very good, Muhammad. Transparency of the government will be under the responsive. They cannot hide how they are working. They cannot hide their policies. They cannot hide their, uh, you know, norms. They cannot skip the procedure. Even though if they are doing, if they are being caught, people will be angry. And of course, then we can question the government. Yes. Ma'am, difference between the transparency and the accountable. Transparency means they are very transparent. Not the transparent that we can see through them. But basically, clear with their action. Yeah, clear with their action. Ashwara ma'am is helping me over there. 
Yes, they are very clear with their action. So, for example, if you are coming to the class, right, it's a very, we will say a very, we have a very transparent environment. That means that there is no hiding of the things, right? If you want to know, ma'am, how you make your PPTs or ma'am, how you do this, I will be able, able to tell you the each and every steps or the procedure that we are following. Yes? Clear everyone? Student Ash, I hope that you are clear. Between the accountability and the transparency. Chalye. Moving ahead to the last point, everyone, we have the legitimate. And this is a point which confused a lot of people. The democracy is a form of government where the leaders are elected by the people. Easy. Now, up, along with that, there's one important thing that we have to look over here is that sometimes it takes a lot of time for them to perform. Right? There, there will be very slow action. But, right? But we know that a democratic government is by the people. Right? It's a legitimate government. It's been made by the people. So, it's a government where, of course, the leaders are elected by the people and it's people own government and they have the authority to change. Clear? Clear everyone and of course there's a lot of support for the democracy. Clear? Prithvi have just explained the difference between the accountable and the responsible. You can go back and watch the session. Everyone are we clear? Are we clear? See accountable means in very simple word people can elect their rulers. Right? Responsive may government has to follow the norms and the rules. And the legitimate, legitimate may we will remember that the leaders are elected by the people and people have the power to change them. Easy? Based upon that, we can say that if we have a free and fair media, coming back to the original question, everyone, which has not been there in the whole uh, marking scheme, is that how the free and fair media help? If we have a free and fair media, they will be able to give a correct pictures to the people and people will become aware about which party is good or which party is not good. They will be able to pick the correct choices. So here we have the answer everyone. Three points are there and this is what you can write over here. That media is a fourth pillar help in fulfilling all the objective of the democratic government and hence is one of the most important outcome of the democracy, right? It needs to make accountability of the various perspective. It, uh, it makes sure the citizens are well informed, right? And it, and it assures that the citizens participate in the decision making also. Clear? Clear everyone? I think now it's time for me to say bye-bye. We'll be calling Ashwara ma'am now everyone. Ma'am, what does the legitimacy exactly mean? It means that legitimate ka ma'am, easy meaning is what? It's like true, right? Like real may something. It's like legitimate. Yeah, it's there. In reality, it's there. So basically, a government which is there, it's for the people, right? And by the people. So it is surrounding by the people and it's more in terms of that they always have a reality check basically if they're not working they can be they can be removed okay clear chalye i'll be coming back later but now my portions are done i guess yeah. it's yours now and i'll be coming in the end right yes okay hello everybody i'm back after a long break and now we go to question number 32 Yes, sure, you can come back and watch it, uh, Shiva Madhumita, no problem, right? So quickly moving on to question number 32, see, geography economics questions are easy. Let me tell you, five marks are easy, only I think one, two, little bit. One is deleted syllabus also, just saying, okay? One is deleted syllabus, so one five marker, so you don't even need to worry about because it's deleted syllabus. Okay, now let's have a look. Bupinder, please pay attention, right? Small, chotu sa bit and then we can do. Describe the circumstances that drive individual to seek loans from informal sources of credit. I always tell you money credit is an easy peasy chapter. Money credit is something that you have to learn because you will get 5 mark questions. And this question to be honest is pretty straightforward, right? So why is it that there are people who are forced to reach out to informal sources like money lenders, traders, right? People who charge them high amount of interest. Now, in some cases, what would happen is that they would require immediate amount, right? Maybe relatives or whatever, we see that sometimes there's a need for an immediate fund. So, in such cases, they may not have time to go through a formal bank, you know, go through formal sources where they have procedure, ye bo, ye bo, karne ke liye time nahi hai. Which is why they may reach out to an informal source. Or in some cases, what do we see? People don't have collateral. 
so we know that collateral is something right girvi right ma'am in hindi so girvi ratna so we know that collateral is very important to show the banks or the formal source that you will be able to pay the money back it could be either in the form of house it could be in the form of a bike or land or whatever it be so in such case if there is no collateral it becomes difficult and if they are desperate they may go out for an informal source or like you said unavailability of document the no proper documented data that is necessary they may not have enough documents that will support their claim for a loan which is why they'll go to this informal source or else what will happen not enough income to actually go and take the loan they may not even be eligible in the first place or they may not have even access so in rural areas we know that there's not enough banks and cooperative societies which are set up as a result of which they depend on money lenders they depend on traders and all of them for money who end up charging a high percentage of interest so in this particular case you need to write down all these pointers very straightforward question nothing you know ulat pulat all proper right so here in this particular case you can write the five points that i have discussed just that in this it looks like four because i have clubbed absence of collateral and unavailability of documents into one but these are two separate points if you write the key pointers you will get five marks for this direct right nothing to worried about it ma'am how to deposit with banks become their source of income because see in the case of banks if this is a bank you have a depositor who is depositing the money and they are giving out loan also right so we can say that there's somebody who is taking the loan now when the depositor deposits the money right we see that they will give back a certain interest as well so let's say that if my savings is 1 lakh rupees and there is a 5% interest now when they give out the loan the loan percentage will always be 8% 9% now what happens if i deposit 1 lakh rupees and i'm getting 5% interest on this they will loan the same 1 lakh rupees but they will charge a higher interest and whatever difference that comes that becomes their source of income that's why banks will constantly push for let's say okay, these kind of things to happen so that increases their income theek hai okay now this is the or aspect of it right this is the or aspect for question 32 in state the potential negative economic implication that would happen if there was no concept of credit see if there is no concept of credit only there is no way in which you can lend a person money what would happen see right now if you don't have 5 rupees and you want to you know uh, i mean 10 rupees and you want to buy choco bar or something like that like hey, give me 10 rupees no let me uh, go and buy that for myself i'll give it back to you later now imagine that concept of credit only doesn't exist then what is going to happen burglary i mean yeah but uh, let's think about what a normal man would do right not in in a let's say a land filled with law not in a lawless area right so in such cases if you cannot you cannot borrow money what will happen see i yeah it will lead to chaos but let's restrict our imagine i mean love your imagination but think about it now if i want to start a business i cannot start a business i should bakery is closed i should bakery is only in my head right now which means that i will not have enough access to start businesses which means that people will not have enough money to sort of do that then what will happen they are entirely dependent on their savings right see if banks are not there then they are dependent on savings now these savings which means that they need to constantly keep working to build their savings and to live their life also which which means that purchases that require high expense like houses cars right fancy shoes if some people want to buy it all that is not going to be possible right because now everything is coming out of your savings which also means that if the concept of credit doesn't exist people's knowledge in finance in itself comes down right because they're like anyway there is no point of me going to the bank getting a loan they not have any idea of how financial processes work so they will not have enough money for that also chori karna padega ha there might be people who may resort to that but along with that what gets restricted the most is financial flexibility because you are dependent entirely on your own money you will be so scared to spend that money elsewhere you imagine you had only 1 lakh rupees and you want to buy a car or you want to buy a scooter because you need that scooter to travel let's say 30 40 kilometers for work what would happen you are spending 85000 just on a scooter 
then you are left with 25,000 and that's all your savings and you need to build those savings once again, right? Which is why we see that there could be potential negative impacts also. Now think of it very logically in such cases. Because if you know what are the advantages of having credit or credit system, think of what would happen if there was no credit. Harsh, this is from money credit chapter. Money and credit. Okay. So five marks if you write more than enough, but this is application. This is a clear example of a very simple concept which requires application. Yes. Now we will move on to things that are going to make you happy, okay? This question and the next question are technically not in your syllabus because lifelines of national economy say question will not come. And you can take a minute and clap, but we will still discuss it quickly. If this comes also, you can solve it because in this question, no, everything is given in the paragraph only. Everything is in the paragraph. You just need to give the answer. So what have they done? They've given us some information about Delhi, Dehradun, Expressway. And they've asked us to talk about the positive and uh, negative aspect of this in economic growth, environment and goal of sustainable development. So let's focus on the first part, which is economic growth. Now, based on this paragraph, we can see that this Delhi Dehradun Expressway is a is basically a construction that is done in order to reduce travel time. So if travel time gets reduced, what would happen? It means that there is more tourism which will get promoted because Dehradun is a tourist, uh, you know, place which is a very popular tourist destination in our country. So trade and tourism will increase because it's easy for me to get to Dehradun. Two, three hours may I will reach. Now, along with this, what, do, what would it mean? It means that when more people are coming, there is more investment, right? More money gets invested in that area. And this construction in itself will promote employment, right? So more people will get money. They'll get more jobs. So employment opportunities will increase. Yes? Siri, I have done a money credit ka one shot. You can find this in the, in the ch um, channel playlist. You'll be able to find it. Next up, it's asking what would be the impact on the environment. See, now this particular expressway is going through an eco-sensitive zone, which means that eco-sensitive zone, that means that there are various um, important organisms or animals that we will find, which is why we see that this can cause a loss of flora and fauna, right? It can also cause, because more people will be using this expressway, more pollution can also happen in that area, right? And along with that, we see that this in turn can affect the quality of life. Now they're asking, what is the goal of sustainability here? See, they're like, even though we are going through an eco-sensitive area and we're doing this construction, they're saying that there are, this particular way would help in reducing impact on wildlife and also provide a section for animal, avoid animal vehicle collision. So if you normally travel a lot by car, right, especially in areas that go through forest areas or that touch through biodiversity rich places, there could be animal uh, vehicle collision. Normally, Bangalore pay half the time there could be elephant crossing also where there are elephants who sort of block the road, right? <coughs> So in this particular case, what do we see? What is the goal of sustainable development? Now, when we talk about sustainable development, our intent is to make sure that we are going to be smart with the way we do this, right? So ensuring that proper construction methods are implemented and reducing carbon emissions. Yes. So that is what we mean by it. Bhargav, you first pay attention in class, then everything else. Okay. So this is how you would write the answer. But as we know, this is deleted syllabus. So we have nothing to worry about. Next is also very easy, okay? They're asking how does air transport make the world a global village? Very simple. Now, when you talk about air transport, we know that air transport specifically or airways, right? They provide accessibility. Now, we're able to go to different parts of the world using airways, right? So, it increases accessibility, which also means that there is increase in trade because now we have cargoes and everything that helps in the transfer. Very good. It boosts tourism. So, if you all want to visit different parts of the world, you can easily visit it because we have airways. And along with that, it improves business and diplomacy, wherein now we are able to not just 
do business within a certain country, but we're able to expand it, right? So like I said, I wanted to open up my eye shoes bakery in New York, which means that I will be able to easily do it because if I want to go transport goods, whatever it be, I have airwaves. And of course, in certain cases, we also have crisis response. So in some cases, like recently where we had the cyclone and the impacts of it, we were able to rescue a lot of it because of the air travel with the help of helicopters and airways, right? So in such cases, what do we see? We see that it helps us with crisis response also. Now, why am I going through this part very quickly? Because we do not have it in our syllabus, which means in your board exam, it is not going to come. This is just there as extra practice. So I hope all of you know that from this chapter, you mainly have map work and you guys have to focus on map work. Yes, map tricks we will be doing very soon. But if you quickly want to have a look at what I have done earlier for the previous batch, I have done map solving. And along with that, uh, there are uh, there's a video done by Tarana Ma'am also. So this right here will definitely help. Yes? Very good. So you can take the screenshots. We will share the PDFs with all of you on Telegram as well. So not to worry about it. And again, like you all know, this particular marking scheme is available on the CBSE website also. Now we will move on to section E. Now section E has relevant questions which I can discuss, right? So moving on to section E which has case-based question. So the first case that we have is a very interesting case. This is from the chapter Agriculture. So everybody, I need your focus on the same, right? Now I'll go through the case very quickly. It's a short case. So we have Climate Smart Agriculture. Climate Smart Agriculture is an approach that helps guide actions to transform agri-food systems towards green and climate resilient practices. This supports reaching internationally agreed goals on sustainable development goals and supports food and agriculture organization framework based on the four betters. Better production, better nutrition, better environment and better life for all. Now based on this, we have four questions, I mean three questions for four marks. Question number one. How does this particular approach or this particular, let's say a CSA expert, suggest the increased production and consumption of millets in India? So he's telling that we should increase production and consumption of millets in India. Now justify their stance. So can you all tell me why should we grow millets in India? So this is a little bit about the advantages of millets, right? Or or based on how the climatic conditions in India support the growth of millets. Yes? So they're indirectly asking you to write two, one, two sentences about millets. That's all. They've just, you know, done ulat pulat and asked you for this. So very quickly, students, you can give me the answers in the live chat. Very good, Sakshi. Millets have high nutritional value, right? So we know that millets include all your coarse grains, which means that they have high nutritional value. What else? Awesome, Asad. Very proud of you. It is a drought resistant crop, which means less water is necessary. Yes. What else? What else can we write about? Now we know that if it's a high nutritional source of food, we also see that for the people who are not able to afford, right? We see that millets will be a good source of nutrition for them where little amount also they will get the kind of nutrients that they require. So in this case, what are the pointers you will write? High nutritional value is an important pointer. They do not require too much of irrigation, right? So they, can, they are drought resistant as well and can be grown in semi-arid and arid regions. So in regions of our country that are not getting enough rainfall, they can be grown easily. Exactly. So here it's for one mark. So you need to write any one point. You don't need to write all of this. Just one mark se ho jayega. Okay? Very good, all of you. Very, very good. Moving on. What is the necessity to think of CSA in India? So why is it that we need to do climate smart agriculture in our country? Yes, what is the need behind it? Exactly, AB, JBR. So if we have JBL, we have JBR for our millets, right? Dry farming methods, okay. But what is the need to implement CSA? Because what is the goal of CSA? It is an approach that tells us to transform our agri-food system. So what is the intent? To shift towards green and climate resilient practices. Exactly. So our country is an ag... <coughs> so our country is an agricultural country. Yes, which means that majority of our population practices agriculture and we need to fulfill the need for large population for sustainable development. Exactly. 
very good so we see that in order to tackle the growing climate changes right and to target the impacts of global warming what do you see we see that in this particular case right we see that in this particular case we observe that there is a need to shift towards green and sustainable or climate resilient practices very good but along with that what do we need to know we need to make it a point that we are aware that the reason for sustainable development is this right so you will get one mark for the same now last one two ways in which india can shift towards this simple first and foremost use more drought resistant ones or genetically modified seeds that are you know genetically modified seeds that are resistant towards insects that are resistant towards drought right so you can tackle these two then along with that what do we see shift towards dry farming methods organic methods natural methods where we reduce how much pollution that comes into it right very good dry farming techniques can also be added two methods you write you will get two marks for the same yes so this is the answer how you will write it so one one mark here one mark here and two marks for the last point now moving on to the last bit of it right so moving on to the 35th question after which i'll call ankita ma'am we have one more passage ma'am i feel this question was more thank you sir i feel this question was more related to water resources ye wala no no the previous one was related more towards agriculture because agriculture may they are also talking about i mean as much as you may say that it is not related to um, see in water resources what do we mainly tackle we are mainly tackling water scarcity right we are tackling water scarcity its impacts and we are talking about multi purpose river valley projects and how you can utilize water and how you can manage water right the amount of water that you have but here in this question we are talking about agricultural practices and what we can do in order to do it more sustainably more efficiently which is why this leans more towards the agriculture chapter ठीक है now question number 35 which is based on population trends and dynamics and what happens and its effect on poverty and sustainable development okay so we're talking about how poverty is influenced by and influences population dynamics such as population growth age structure rural urban distribution okay now we're talking about how this is very critical towards the country's development so this is from your chapter development right how we can or what are the parameters for development basically so based on this we're talking about how we need to make investment in better health reproductive health uh, and for reducing mortality and morbidity so on and so forth right so in this case what do we need to answer how does investing in an improved healthcare infrastructure red contribute towards reducing chronic conditions so what are they saying they're asking us okay if there are people who if we need to go make or take steps towards a country's development how is healthcare infrastructure playing a role yes okay so how do we do this now we're talking about investing in healthcare infrastructure which means that if i have better healthcare services if i have more accessibility to hospitals i have more people employed in healthcare sectors it would mean that now i am able to treat such diseases i am able to do research and understand how i can tackle those resources i mean how i can tackle those diseases and such chronic conditions so thereby what do we see accessibility is step number 1 having access to such services now what do these services include it means that that we need to get vaccinated covid was the best example that i can give you right covid was a worldwide pandemic but we were able to tackle because of our ability to have knowledge our ability to do research we had those resources available to us and people were vaccinated so vaccinations are also important prenatal care in the case of pregnant women and treatment for common diseases so regularly if you get treated we are able to so uh, if we are getting treated regularly then our body also builds immunity right what is chronic condition when it's prolonged for a long period of time right so that means that is what we understand as chronic if people's uh, health is good then they will be more productive could that be a reason yes that could be a reason sakshi but here they specifically asking you the impact of healthcare infrastructure 
So they are telling you that if I build hospitals and I have those facilities made, how will that help me? That could be an indirect point that you could write. But along with that, you need to also mention about how this is a prevention method, right? This will help in reducing the number of people who die from, say, preventable diseases. Had they been diagnosed earlier, we could have made an effort to sort of save their lives, right? Many people who, especially in rural areas, we see that they are not able, they don't have access. Or we see that the people who are employed there, they don't have enough facilities. Maybe the hospitals don't have proper surgical rooms, they don't have equipment. Because of all those cases, we see that this right here would be a impact. I know Harsh, that's why Ankita told me not to make false promises. I am the boss of telling you that I will do it at 9 and take one extra hour. So please don't mind. Okay. Next up, they're asking you what is the relationship between population trend and poverty reduction. Easy. That is given to you in the textbook only, right? I mean, in the paragraph itself, they have told you poverty is influenced by and influences population dynamics, which include all these things, right? And how does it have an impact in all these manners, right? So they have already told us. So if the population continues to increase, right? We know that we are not at population increase. We are at a population explosion where there's an exponential increase. So what would happen if more number of people, more number of resources, more need for land, water, food, right? Thereby we see that the standard of living increases, thereby for people who don't have access to it, that can get impacted, right? Okay, now last part of the question, which is poverty is influenced. Ha, huh, they've taken the line from that and they've asked you to um, highlight the mutual relationship between population and poverty. So basically, the pretty similar thing you have to infer from your case. So here we have told that population explosion is going to have an exert on your, will exert your natural resources, right? Will exert your food resources, which also means that if more number of people, we need more infrastructure, right? So increasing poverty. Now, in such cases, what do we see? It can affect labor markets and support systems. So there might not be enough jobs also which are going to be available. And thereby, we see that in urban areas and rural areas, we see a drastic difference. So especially when it comes to access to services. See, whenever we talk about, uh, let's say, healthcare, when we talk about, let's say, even a grocery store or even let like, think about it as a medical store. In a city, every road may, every here and there, you will find some medical store, you will find something or the other. But if you go to a town or if you go to a village, that changes. You will see that you will find a medical store maybe once in every 5-6 kilometers only. So now for people to get medicines or if they immediately need it, they need to travel a lot, right? So that is what I mean by access. Then along with that, what do we see? Poverty can contribute to things like limited access to health care. We see that, you know, when it comes to feminine health care, when it comes to, you know, when say they're pregnant and they require certain treatments, they may not have access to all of that. Regional disparities, exactly. Or in this case, it would be with respect to your um, rural urban areas. So based on this, like I said, you have to write the answer and this is one, one mark each and you will get two marks for this particular one. So with this, we have done with two cases and this is the first time I have seen that there is a case based question both from geography and economics, which rarely happens in the board exam. Because for some reason in the board, CBSE loves giving political science and history. But nonetheless, in this practice paper, we had it. So we'll quickly move on to the last question on your section D after which we have section F. Oops, section E. Yeah. And I'll hand it over to Ankita Ma. But, yeah, we have section E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. This is the last question from the case based study question, right? And this is a very interesting question because this is from the chapter The Rise of the Nationalism in India. So, over here, let me just change the pen color. We are talking about Gandhiji and what he addressed in the All India Congress community in Mumbai on this particular occasion right so we have all of these detail so we will quickly read what he said and this is very inspiring let's see and we have this in our textbook in the orange box so it's very crucial to read the orange boxes because we do have questions from them so you take it from me that i am going to strike a bargain and with the viceroy of ministry and the like i'm not going to be satisfied with anything short of complete freedom. That's what Gandhiji is speaking at that particular time. Maybe, may, maybe 
he will propose an abolition of the salt law, the drink evil, etc. But I will say nothing less than freedom. So we are clear that what he is asking for the freedom. Here is a mantra, a short one, and that I will give you. You may imprint in your heart and let every breath of your life, of yours, giving expression to it. The mantra is do or die. And I'm sure you, your teachers, before your examination, you will be saying the same thing. Do and you'll be getting your marks. Right? So this is a mantra which came and again, a one marks question can come from here. That which mantra did the Gandhiji gave at that particular time? That is do or die. We shall either be free, free India or die in an attempt. We shall not live to see the perpetration of the slavery. Every true congressman or women will join the struggle with an inflexible determination not to remain alive to see the country in bondage and the slavery. Let that be your pledge. Keep jails out of your consideration. So I hope that all of you have read it. Nahi padai to please make sure you go in after this class, open your NCRT and read it. Yes? Done everyone? Yes, karo ya maro, absolutely, absolutely correct. So this is the situation, before your examination also, your teachers will be telling you, study, 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 that's your last time before you study for your particular subject. So let's take a look everyone, that's a paragraph and we have three questions and we have to answer the question. Let's take a look at the question. The first question is over here, we have three questions in total, two marks, one marks and one marks. We are going with the first question. Yes, absolutely correct. Explain any one key impact that Gandhiji rejection of striking a bargain with the Viceroy of Ministry and like had on the people participating in the freedom struggle. Very straightforward question, right? The question is very simple. They are just asking us any one key impact of what Gandhiji said. What was the impact on the people? Tell me what was the impact? It's there in the, uh, it's there in the uh, paragraph itself. Yes, we will have the map work also. I think in five minutes we'll be able to do that also. No? <laughs> yes. Here everyone, let's see the answer. The people joined the freedom struggle with a strong determination and pledge not to live right to see the India slavery. So of course, they were very clear. They were very clear that they will not wait anymore now. They wanted to go out and fight for the freedom. That's what happened after the Gandhiji's address. That's one marks for us. Moving to the next question, everyone. Next question, everyone. How did this mantra differ from the early strategies employed in the struggle of independence? How this particular mantra right do or die was very different from the early strategies strategies that were made right uh, for the struggle for the independence tell me we have seen before this right uh, india would have seen the non cooperation movement happening civil disobedient movement what do you think will be the you know uh, what do you think will be the uh, mantra behind this not so serious, not so serious and determined earlier. Yes, we have seen that initially when we have these two movements, big movements at a very larger scale, people participated in the beginning with all the josh, with all their full hearts. But after time, they stopped supporting the movements. People started looking for their own benefits and stopped working for the nation. And hence, they took some of the paths which were following the violence and that's how we saw that non-cooperation movement was withdrawn. Yes? Very good. Yes. Absolutely correct. So what are the points we can write over here? First, the movement that was aimed right at achieving a complete independence without accepting any consciousness or the partial freedom from the British government. So basically, initially, Britishers were saying, you will give you half independence. We will be controlling. You will have your individuals over there. The people were not ready to have that. In early strategies, right, especially such as the non-violent disobedient movement and negotiation was focused on pressing the British government to grant the reforms, right? Of course, this is not the correct way over there. The last one, do and die approach is contrast and it clearly signals that we are ready for the freedom. We are capable and we want the freedom now. Now, you cannot fool us by giving us partial 
partial uh, government or partial freedom. So everyone, I hope that you got this answer. Yes, very good. They were not trained for the mass struggle. Can I, we can write that point. Yes, okay. Moving to the next, the last question everyone. Last question of the section E. Discuss the economic context and the political climate that led to the adoption of do and die mantra. Two marks question everyone. Two marks easy peasy question. We have to discuss the economical, economic context and the political climate. What do you think was the condition at that particular time? After the civil disobedience movement, after the non-cooperation movement, we know that the economy was definitely increasing after the World War I and World War II, right? Indian factories were making the uh, dresses, weapons, shoes for the Britishers, right? And of course, they were the industries and the uh, manufacturing factories were definitely growing. In the political climate also, at that particular time in India, the political leaders have gained a lot of knowledge. People are more aware about it and they are ready to fight for the country. Yes? Very good. High taxes. Very good. Very good. High taxes on food and the political parties. Yes. Okay. So let's take a look everyone at the answer. We will just put it in a very... From the paragraph. So we know that during the struggle, freedom struggle, that there is a failure of British government and various promises that they did, right? One of the important things that we will remember over here, they have mentioned about the World War II. First, the movement had triggered the discontent among the in Indians due to the harsh impact on the economy and the living conditions. Second, the political climate in India was tense because, of course, they were growing impatient for the complete independence or the complete Swaraj. And later, Mahatma Gandhi ji advocating the non-violent civil disobedience movement, right? Sought to be very decisive strategies to break the statement negotiation with the British. This is very, very crucial, right? So this is how you can write the answer in the examination. Zayat, this question is very simple. We just have to find from the paragraph that what are the economical, economic context in the political climate after the adoption, the do and die, or why it was there. Student Ash, yes, according to me, by reading NCRT, oh. Yeah, you, AV, yes, we don't have the age of industrialization. It's there just for the internal examination. Probably in your uh, pre-boards, you might have a question, but not in the board examination. Yes. Okay. So with this, everyone, we are actually done with the part where we have, you can take the screenshot, we'll share the, we will share the uh, PDF on the Telegram group also. I'll explain you that, but let's just quickly finish the uh, section F part where we have the map work. We'll call Ashwarya ma'am now. Yeah, we have the two of history, which is very easy. The first one over here. Uh, so again, everyone, for the history and for the geography also, there are three important things that will be asking you. Either they are labeling or we have to identify or locate. <laughs> yes. So then history we have a place where the Jallianwala Bagh took place. Where the Jali see we have only I think five, five map work in the first chapter that is the rise of the nationalism in India. Second chapter. And we have it on our channel also so in the shorts you would have seen it. Yes, the place where the Jallianwala Bagh took place is there in Amritsar. In Punjab, we'll write Amritsar. And in Punjab, because in the map, they have shown Punjab, so we can mention. The second one is in 1927, Indian National Congress session was held at this particular place. And it was there in, we can clearly see it's there in Tamil Nadu. And we, it's, it happened in the Madras. We'll not write Chennai. Right, we'll not write Chennai. We will write Madras. Yes. May lose marks, huh? Yes, if, if you write China, you might be losing your marks because in the text, in the history, it is still called as Madras session and the place, it's Madras. Okay, Charlie, everyone, ma'am, over to you. Yes, so now you get two marks from this and then now you have three marks for the last bit of it. Now, for geography, you have to locate 
and remember water resources you have to locate mineral and energy resources map is very important then of course lifelines of national economy that is also important right and manufacturing industries how could i forget that ma'am how to remember this map see you don't need to memorize the map per se but like i always tell you with respect to maps right now this is the technique i use whenever i have to mark something i tend to see, see first i should know where it is there it should not be that i don't know where exactly what is little bit general geography you should have an idea of where you might find noida or in which state you will find noida or where you will find cuticon so you need to have that general kind of idea then after that in order to locate it on the map per se no i use a very weird met method now normally for example if let's say i have to mark noida right so of course i can't enlarge this image at the moment but i might think of it as okay from here i see that if there is a loop next to that at the bottom i might put a dot there so i use very weird techniques and if you want to know more about how exactly i do it there's a video for which i will put it in the comments but use your creativity is exactly what i would say because all of us have different ways of remembering things you and i will not have the same technique in which we may recall something so with map especially use place holders on the sides so on top it should be somewhere it should, you know use those kind of place holders that would definitely help you out yeah that's what i do i know that's a very um, i would also say that i am a child when it comes to this i use this kind of a technique right now which is a dam which is built built on satluj river these you need to know you can't be like ma'am i how will i remember this no this you'll have to remember based on the states right so you need to know on which state through which satluj is flowing and based on that which river which multi purpose river valley i will find so we have bakran bakran angle then software technology park in northern india that has to be noida of course southern most port in the eastern coast right they have specified it southern most port in the eastern coast which means that even though you have chennai they are talking about the southern most which means it has to be uh, tutecon ma'am i marked it yeah you lose marks there no see this is where noida has to come not near um uh, not i think uh, ashvi you have marked it a little bit at the bottom which is a border of up and rajasthan no it has to come a little above right so no that you may lose marks there ma'am where is all the map i want the map i will put the link of that video in the comments right okay nuclear power plant in the state of maharashtra so much they have given to you in the state of maharashtra so that we know is mainly found in tarapur which is in the border so you can mark this as something which is closest to gujarat right closest to gujarat is something you can use as a reference yes so with the students with map work firstly know your syllabus for map it is there in the cbse website i've also done a short for the same sec <coughs> secondly make it a point that all of you are checking and practicing it will they give the states they'll give you an outline political map so they'll give you the map that is here itself right so you will be able to get it easily if you know the states and you know where exactly they fall it should be easy so with this a quick reminder to all of the students that you have reached the very end of this practice paper we know this practice paper was not easy some were so direct that you were like mom this is halwa some of them were like mom which chapter is this question even from but in the end let me tell you that you guys are going to ace it right and of course one thing i would say is that to test if you are going to ace your exams and just to give a test to check how much you've learned from this chapter i mean from this session there is a small google form test for all of you in the comments of this video click on the form link and you can give me the you know there's just five easy questions so based on this you let me know how many of you have scored 5 out of 5 in that exam and let us know in the comments because those of you who give us the entries let's say 1 hour so now it's 10 19 which means till 11:30 i will be accepting entries now till 11:30 we'll accept entries and those of you who do attempt it and of course spread the word to your friends who left the session in between we will be featuring all of you on our community post as well right so don't forget to attempt the test that is there So with the students I will call Ankita ma'am and we will be signing off
we know that this is set one but ma'am i think we'll then cover up some of more of their syllabus do a lot more practice and then do set two right yes everyone so we anyways do have a lot of videos on our channel that we did last year that are still relevant because they're still part of it's the based syllabus. on the rationalized yeah. syllabus itself so please make sure you go through those videos and we will be coming up and we'll be finishing off your syllabus really very soon and most importantly many of you who stayed with us right from the beginning till the so very much. end we're super proud of you and no matter when you came it's okay i would recommend that you come back watch this video put it on 2x and go through these questions because students you guys are all panicking about your pre-boards and i'm telling you this is like a cheat sheet to your pre-board paper half the time your teachers are going to be taking it from sample paper and these additional practice yes. sets so basically these are the questions that are there in the market right and of course making them is very difficult so we have these and of course we'll be reusing them so please make sure you go through all of these yes. right and we have practice paper one and we have practice paper two so we still have a long way to go to the practice paper two but before that even if you're saying now our pre-boards ho gaye hain and we are chill pill as you saying in the beginning please make sure you go through the sample paper practice papers both the practice papers and we have the marking scheme on the ncr cbse website so please make sure you go through them and of course don't worry tips and tricks i understand for geography many of you are feeling nervous about it so at the earliest i will come up with another session which has all the ma map work along with which i will be taking tips tricks ways to study techniques strategies nice. we'll be doing an entire one for geography and specifically for history as well yes. because like we said for studying every book right you cannot use the same strategy what i tell you for let's say geography cannot be same to same for history right yes. ma'am because the techniques are different there there are two different subjects altogether so it probably the techniques will not work the only thing which works ma'am is to write the answer in the points yeah that's the only thing that makes sense over there but apart from that the learning techniques are different and we'll make sure that we have the sessions Okay so with this i know that uh, we have come to the end thank you so much everybody yes. uh, we will see you all soon but up until then students take care lots of love to all of you and bye 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 everyone do take care of yourself and keep on learning with byjuice good night everyone bye bye